Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the October 10th Oklahoma City Planning Commission meeting and uh, ask if you have uh, cell phones, pagers, or other devices, uh, if you would silence those at this time. For those of you not familiar with uh, Planning Commission procedures, on the uh, back of the face page of the agendas that were available out front, uh, describes a little bit about our routine. A number of you have already signed up, but uh, for those, anyone who might have missed it, if you are not the applicant and you want to talk to us about a case, if you would complete one of these and give it to our staff, we'd be happy to hear you uh, when we hear the case. And with that, we'll go to the um, minutes for September 26th. I note that uh, one item uh, did not indicate that there were protesters present. And it was the same case where I failed to vote inadvertently. Uh, and for whatever difference it makes, I would have voted in favor of the application had I recorded my vote. But I was the one who caused the problem last time. So I apologize and to the applicants and to the protesters both. Any other changes to the minutes or approval? Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Cast your votes, and they're approved. Continuous requests, Russell? Uh, we have four uncontested requests for continuance today. Item 30 is uh, the PUD ordinance, which has been continued until October the 24th. Item 31 is C6493, also until October the 24th. And item 32, PUD 1507 until October the 24th. Item 33, C6494, has been withdrawn. Is there anyone here today who came to talk to us about the first six items on our agenda? Four. Approve the uncontested continuance. Second. We have a motion and second to approve the uncontested continuances. Cast your votes. And those are approved. Uh, new request for continuance, item 12, is PC 10355, has a request to continue until October the 24th, item 13, C6519, until October the 24th, item 14, PC 10353, until November the 14th, item 15, C6514, until November the 14th, item 16, PC 10347, until November the 14th, Item 22, SPUD 729, until October the 24th. And item 25, C6528, until October the 24th. Is there anyone here today who came to talk to us about any of the items other than 14, which we're about to hear about? Mark? Mark Grubbs, uh, 1819 South Morgan Road. Uh, I would like to withdraw items 14 and 15. Meaning from the continuance docket or completely? No, completely. Completely withdrawing the application. Okay. Uh, we have a number of people signed up on item 14 today uh, who are in opposition. The request is to withdraw the application completely. Do you understand what we're, we're saying? It would remain zoned AA. In other words, the zoning request is being withdrawn entirely. That was going to be my comment, is uh, to request a little clarification on the process here, which if they withdraw it, then that removes this item in its entirety from the balance of the agenda as well. Yes. yes. Tell me your name and address for the record, please. So Scott Cusack. Uh, I'm using P.O. Box 1317, Mustang, Oklahoma. Okay. Thank you. Anyone who wants to hear, have us hear this case? Okay. Uh, I move approval you, of the. Do you want to say something? I was just wondering if they're actually they're dropping it. Completely. They're dropping it. It's being dropped. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I move approval. 
Second. Well, we're approval of the additional requests, including and with withdrawal all items items 14 and 15. Yes, Second. sir. Okay. Cast your votes. And items 14 and 15 are withdrawn. The other continuances listed are approved. Are there any additional? Oh, wait a minute. Let me wait. Yeah. JJ, can you get the door? Oh, never mind. It, it closed. Are there any additional continuance requests from the public today? Okay, we are on the consent docket. Uh, there are six items on consent today. Item one is C6531. Item two, C. 5484, item 3, C6087, item 4, C6059, item 5, CE867, and item 6, PUDSP1491. We did those, didn't we? No, we, okay. we, we didn't continue. Anyone here to talk to us about those items today? Consent docket items 1, one through 6? I move the consent docket. Okay. Second. The motion is second to approve the consent docket. Cast your votes. That's approved. Item 7 is CE868. This is an application by Maya N. LLC and uh, Ramji Krupa and Purcell Motel Investments and SHEV2 LLC to close a utility easement at 15,000 North Penn. Board 8. Is the applicant here? Katie Oakley, 3048 North Grand Boulevard, Oklahoma City. Uh, we want relief so that we can relocate the existing sewer line so that a restaurant can be constructed over where the existing line runs now. No one signed up? No approval. Second. We have a motion and second to approve item seven. Cast your votes. And it's approved. Thank you. Item eight is C6533. This is the final plat of South Meadow in Ward 3. Mark Grubbs, Grubbs Consulting, 1819 South Morgan Road, on behalf of the applicant. Um, this uh, request for a final plat conforms with the preliminary plat. We agree to all the TEs and ask your approval. Okay, uh, we do have somebody signed up. Les Franklin? If you would give us your name and address, please. Les Franklin, 5325 Hidden Meadow Drive, Mustang, okay. Oklahoma. Uh, I saw the uh, plat that was sent to me in the mail. My concern on this is what size lots, what kind of acreage is it with these? You couldn't really tell from the, the drawing. Well, it would be RA2 lots, so Ma Mark, you can tell them what you've got in mind. Uh, they're generally two acres in size. Okay, this is my, our property adjoining it is five acre tracks and that's what I wanted just to make sure that we're not, but they are going to be minimum of two acre tracks? Uh, I'm, they're not, they're not a minimum of two acres, they're, some of them are under, but they're generally two acres in size. They're, okay, that was my concern. Thank you. I have some acres. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, no one else signed up? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve item eight, cast your votes. And that's approved, thank you. Item nine is C6516. This is the final plat of Settlers Ridge, section nine in Ward three. Good afternoon, Jason Spencer with Craft & Toll, here to represent the applicant. We've got a final plot application for the last phase in Settlers Ridge. It's uh, northwest of Reno and Cemetery. 
Uh, it conforms with the approved preliminary plat. Uh, we're in agreement with all the TEs, and we'd request approval at this time. No one signed up. Move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 9. Cast your votes. And you're approved. Thank you. Thank you. Item 10 is PUD 1506. It's an application by Ellison Investments to rezone 2015 North Kilpatrick Turnpike from PUD 153 to PUD 1506 in Ward 1. Uh, Warren Peacock with WPM Design Group. Um, this is part of the preliminary plat, which is on the next item. Uh, this was part of a larger PUD, which was originally approved several years ago. It was PUD 153. All of this area west of the turnpike was designated as R1. Uh, and we, the developer wanted to put some R2 in this area. Now, the, the original PUD 153 has, um, it's a mixed use, and there is some other uh, higher densities on the east side of the turnpike. But with the lakes that we have here and the buffering, we felt like this was a good opportunity and a good location for some R2 zoning. So that's our request. Uh, we don't have any comments on the staff recommendation. We agree with their TE, so. Be happy to answer any questions. No one signed up, Commissioners. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 10. Cast your votes. And that's approved. <coughs> and item 11, C6513, is a preliminary plat of Mara Lago, the same property, Ward 1. Uh, once again, this is a preliminary plat uh, that has the zoning just approved in, in it. Um, one TE that I would like to talk about and ask a re, uh, request a variance is TE number two. The staff is requesting that we provide an additional connection on the north side of the uh, plat, which would go, would go across that a blank space that's almost right down the middle of the plat. That is an actual pipeline easement. Uh, we would request that we be allowed to put a temporary fire access or a temporary gravel road built to fire department standards because once we build the roadway on the south which will connect the two areas we will meet the criteria for number of lots on a dead-end street uh, and what the staff has told me they've been concerned about is that street to the south will probably be built in a later phase or toward the end so that there was concern that we'd have a lot of lots on a dead-end street for a long period of time so my request would be to change that as a temporary connection between the two sections on the north end rather than a permanent connection. And then Planning Commissioner Hensley has requested that I guarantee or make the commitment to the Planning Commission we will be providing interconnecting trails or sidewalks through this development to make sure that the homeowners on the west side have access to all of the ponds and, and uh, lakes and amenities that will be on the east. And we, we, we had already planned on doing some of that, but we will be committed to making that circulation for pedestrian traffic. So will you do it at least two? Or, I mean, what, what's the commitment provide? For sidewalks? For interconnection from east to west, pedestrian connection east to west. I would say at least two, possibly three. I mean, it would, it, we want to make it such that people wouldn't have a long distance to have to walk to be able to get to one of those lakes if they wanted to. So you've got three lakes that pretty much abut that pipeline on the east side. I think three connections would be, would that's, be reasonable. That's why I'm asking yeah. the yeah. question. Would be reasonable, yes. Yeah, I agree. We just want to make sure that the people on the west can get to the east because that's where primarily so the amenities we'd commit to at least three connections between the two sides. Now, would this, so, would why this don't we on the final plot? When this is a preliminary plan. Will we see? Will we see the trails and the stuff that you're talking about and the connection on the final plat? Yes, I mean it would be a part of the minutes, so we'll have to do it. And as we bring it in, we'll work with staff on how they'd like to see those interconnections made, and then we'll do it at the final plat stage. Because okay. we'll, this is probably well, going to we'll be built that, out in right? about three phases. Okay. All right. Do you mind if? Uh, <coughs> We amend TE2 uh, to provide for that uh, temporary fire department access. Yes. That's what we'd request. With, with three pedestrian access that's points. That's fine. The, yes, that's fine. So that'll be the TE then. Okay. Okay. Right. 
So with that, uh, I'll move approval of the application amending TE2 providing for the temporary fire access uh, across the easement there. Um, and then the three uh, permanent uh, access to the common areas um, connecting the two halves uh, uh, pedestrian access. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve item 11 as amended. Cast your votes. And that's approved. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Items 12 and 13 have been continued. Items 14 and 15 have been withdrawn. Item 16 is continued. Item 17 is C6515. This is the final plat of Lone Oak East Phase 1 in Ward 8. Commission Robert Haupt on behalf of the developer, Lone Oak Inc., regarding Lone Oak East. I've just passed out a couple documents that I'll be referring to that may be of help to each of you. Um, I'll try not to read them verbatim, having sat through a lengthy meeting two weeks ago. As you know, the staff, uh, the Planning Commission staff is required to publish their staff reports prior to these meetings, as they did. We've reviewed those staff reports very closely, and in response to both the staff report before the preliminary hearing and this, the final, the hearing on the final plat, we have agreed to accept each of the TEs that are listed. No question, each of the TEs that have been identified and recommended have been accepted by the developer. As well, we, at the preliminary hearing, we agreed or we stated that we were withdrawing our request for a variance, and I echo that today. We're again withdrawing our request for the variance. Now, the staff recommended acceptance and approval of our application at the preliminary stage. At the final stage, based only upon, only upon the 5-0 vote at the preliminary hearing, the staff has changed that recommendation. But that is the only basis. Nothing else in this report has changed. And again, we accept each of the TEs. I want to be clear on what the staff report says. There is no indication that flooding is an issue. To challenge the flood study is try to put the cow back in the barn. The clomer has already been issued to the city of Oklahoma City. The flood study is no longer at issue here. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent by the developer. Countless hours have been spent by the, the Planning Commission staff in assessing this. And FEMA has already issued its clomer. Second of all, there is no issue that has been established anywhere with regard to traffic. Let's be clear what we're talking about. An 80-acre development, 355 lots, directly abutting 150, well, Northwest 150th to the south. And it goes roughly a third of the way up toward 164th. But that's it. That is the only development, that is the only project, those are the only lots that are before this commission period, at this time, period. Finally, there was an issue, and I know several of you weren't here and had to leave because of the hour, but there was a question about fire and fire response time. I'd like to refer you to what we've handed you. First, Exhibit 2, we contacted the fire department. The question that was asked, I believe, by Commissioner Gale when he stepped down and called the fire department is, where would the response come from in the event of a fire at Lone Oak East, or Lone Oak? I'm not sure that Lone Oak East was identified Lone Oak. He came back and reported that it would be coming from the north. We've confirmed, and it's in writing, attached to you in these emails on Exhibit 2, that the response would come from one of three stations. Station 3 at 11601 North MacArthur, Station 15 at 2817 Northwest 122nd, or finally, Station 37 at 16820 North Penn. We inquired whether there was an order to where the response would come first. The response was, as is written here, it doesn't matter. They'll all be there within seconds of each other. So uh, that all, the issue of that the, uh, the fire response would come from the north is no longer an issue. 
We have with us today Mr. Kuhn, who's been the engineer on this project from day one. We have the principals of the developer, Tim Smith and, and Butch Curry. So if there's any questions that anyone on the commission has, we would like you to bring it up and let's address it right now while we have everyone here. The, the issue of Northwest 164th and that collector road, that's been talked about for a long time before this commission. That, that road does not, that issue does not become an issue in and of itself. It only becomes an issue if it's tied to, one, to a problem somewhere else. If it's tied to a traffic problem, if it's tied to fire protection and response time problem, there is no evidence that has been indicated anywhere, no factual indication anywhere, flood, traffic, fire, anywhere else, that that road, Northwest 164 up to 164th, is needed. By the way, this is consistent with PUD 706, Section 8.5 where it says in there that the collector road simply goes up and is developed as each adjacent lot is developed. So we only have to go as far north as are the lots. That is PUD 706, which has been adopted by the city council. That is the law. That's our ordinance. To, to expect that we build a road up north of these 355 lots would require at least a $2 million expense for no economic gain. No economic gain, no economic justification, no legitimacy, as evidenced by the staff, the commission staff reports. We have a great deal of confidence and respect in the planning commission staff. And after hours and hours and hours of review and report, they do not request, recommend, or suggest that that road has any validity or any usefulness or need to satisfy these other conditions. To impose the requirement on the developers to build that road that is not needed, that we do not even know where it would go, essentially shuts down this development. It essentially bars any reasonable, legitimate use of that property the 80 acres where the 355 lots are going. And that is why we're here again today asking the commission to vote in favor of our application. This is not just about losing money. This is not just about economic gain, economic cost. This is about complete and total denial of the use of that property. This is perhaps as clean of a design, as clean of a plan as we can comprehend. 355 units, good access to it, no problems indicated by the staff report, no problems indicated other than allegations that have been asserted out there perhaps by neighboring homeowners. Most of the neighboring homeowners are not here. Most of the neighboring homeowners have never expressed an objection. So we're asking the commission again today to approve, to approve our application for final approval of this plat and accept the recommendation that have been made by the city staff. I'll reserve time, if I may, to respond after any objectors um, uh, speak. Or I can address now if there's any questions or other information that is needed by any of the commissioners. Well, I have one, I have one yes, or sir. two quick ones. Please. Uh, refresh me on how much real estate your client owns well, here in this section. In that overall area, I can find out. Approximately 600 acres overall. Okay. But, but we have no, the plan we have now is only this 80 acres. You know, the good part, and we, we tried to point this out, I think, at the, I think Mr. Kuhn made this point. <coughs> and I'll, make, I'll answer your question hopefully directly, but a couple things first. These developers have been developing residential real estate on Northwest Oklahoma City for 25 years. This isn't like they're out of town people who are coming in just to abuse this property and leave. This is their home. They're going to be here. We understand yeah. that. This is not about them. Yes, good, um, good. And second of all, as Mr. Kuhn has said, your flooding is a huge deal in his business. And for 30 years, he has never designed a project that has failed due to flooding. Now, to answer your question, the um, 
uh, the, the, I've lost your question. I'm sorry, Mr. Yoko. Well, my, my question was how much real estate was owned because when we first saw this, I think we saw a much larger proposal. So you this did. has now been pared down. And now, and now I know the answer to your question. Yeah. The, the good news is we cannot do one thing beyond this application, beyond this 80, roughly 80 acres, without standing back here, making new application, going back before the staff, meeting with the staff, starting this whole, everything that we have done now, we would have to do again if we expanded beyond this 80 acre, 355 lot project. Oh, I think we all understand yeah. that. And so that's why we're saying the rest of it, we don't know what's going to happen there. All we know is 80 acres, 355 lots. Mr. Yoko. Now, my next question, you referred to uh, the PUD and the language uh, with respect to uh, moving a connection north. Yes, sir. And you said uh, you're only required to uh, bring that street north as you build lots that would front on it? Yes, sir. I could read that part to the, uh, to the commission. It's, I believe it's section 8.5. And the way it reads, Mr. Yokel, is at the time of the development of each abutting track, each abutting track, we believe that means parcel, dirt, a 32-foot collector street will be constructed through the development from 150th to 164th as shown in the master development plan. So again, this is important. That's a fair question. So as this property is developed, south, presumably south to north, that collector road has to follow the development. That has always been the plan of the developers. So here, as we go from south to north, and we reach the northern part, 355 years, that collector road will be built all the way up to that point. If it goes beyond that, that collector road will be extended specifically as provided in PUD 706, section 8.5. And if you'd like to see, I have it here. Uh, no, I, I accept your reading of it. Thank you. Uh, I've got eight or ten people who've signed up to speak. And okay, I'll, I'll reserve my I'll, But I'll ask, I'll ask a question so that they don't. Uh, you will obviously come back in with additional uh, preliminary and final plat requests for these this 600 odd acre tract. I don't know that. We, we've talked about that extensively, Mr. Yoko. We do not know that to be true. Well, we don't know it today, but uh, I would consider it a not unreasonable prospect given the fact that we originally saw this as a much larger proposal. So I, I at least wouldn't think that that's not ever likely to happen. Well, again, we'd love to agree with you. We hope you're right. <laughs> But we don't know that, and we could not no, sit here today and see the plans for that. But if I understand that PUD language, you could plat as you went and go north and stop 100 feet from 164th Street, and you would never connect to the north. PUD only. That might be right. That would be unreasonable, I would suggest. But that might be right. But there's other protections. There would be issues involving traffic studies that will be odd, would be ongoing. Staff reports, you know, highly respected, highly experienced, highly competent staff who would be recommending to this commission di perhaps different conclusions. We but, say that about them all the time, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but, highly but, competent, highly re recommended, and we usually agree with them, but we're not bound to. Uh, but I appreciate that. And of the documents I've given the um, commission, I should at least explain what I've given you. The okay. first is, I think it's somewhat out of order, but exhibit two is a series of emails, a string of emails involving the fire department, because we want you to know that we're not just making these allegations. We have gone and, and done this checking. Uh, uh, exhibit one, which is actually the third exhibit, is an affidavit from Mr. Kuhn, because it's easy for lawyers to stand up and make arguments, but I want the commission to know that there, this is a sworn statement and these are 
uh, coming directly from the principles of the developer. We think that's important. And then the third is Exhibit 3, and I will go ahead and address that. The developers, as you recognize, Mr. Yoko and commissioners, have been doing this a long time. They're only as successful as they have satisfied customers, as they have people out there talking about the quality of their work, as with any professional. We have taken seriously and taken in good faith all of the objections that have been made. That's why we think we have gone overkill, overboard, checking through traffic, through flood, through fire. All of these objections have been raised to us. What I've shown is Exhibit 3, and we've tried never to make this personal. Never have we gone that route. But on July 19, there was an email sent out to a lot of people regarding the objectors those who have filed objections to this, to this application. And it admits here that fighting this, these applications will present some challenges because in itself, the portion that they're submitting on the preliminary plan will not cause as tremendous impact to traffic schools, floor plan, et cetera, that the entire previously proposed plan would, proposed development would. Exactly, exactly. And that's why we stopped here, because we stopped with the part that is certain that there is no objection whatsoever. If we go to the next part and we can't meet our proof, our persuasion to this commission, the commission won't approve it. But that's, that's not before the commission today. What's before the commission today, 80 acres, 355 lots, which the objectors appear to recognize is not going to cause anywhere near the kind of problems that they were concerned with before. I'll reserve and be available okay. if there's any other questions. I do have, and Eric, I'll just make this statement before you start. We do have seven or eight people who have signed up in addition to uh, <coughs> Mr. Groves. And uh, when you do come up, I'll ask that you not repeat what someone before you might have said. So if you have new information for us after you've heard your neighbor speak, we would like to hear that. Go ahead, Eric. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, my name is Eric Groves. I'm an attorney. I represent the Remington Neighborhood Association, which is to the immediate south of the area proposed to be platted. <clears throat> We're going to try to keep this presentation brief this afternoon. Uh, I think many of the people who have signed up will not actually speak. They're just signing in. We will have one neighborhood representative speak for all neighborhoods. It'll be Ginny Mason, and it will be very brief. Uh, let us begin at the beginning. <clears throat> this uh, is part of an area that was submitted to the Commission previously as a preliminary plat and denied. The applicant here was the applicant there. They appealed that denial, the preliminary plat, to the District Court. And the long and short of it is uh, that it was heard on the record. The District Court upheld the Commission's decision. The applicant has appealed the decision of the District Court to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. That case is pending. In upholding the decision of this commission, the Oklahoma County District Court, Judge Lisa Davis, found your decision denying the preliminary plat not to be arbitrary and capricious and unreasonable. In other words, it was reasonable. Um, on the merits. This plat proposes the same or worse problems than the predecessor did. Uh, PUD um, 706 has language in it, uh, some of which was quoted by applicants' counsel about building a road north of 164th. The PUD is an old PUD. You can tell it by its number. And that was the rule when that PUD was done, but things have changed. There are many, many, many more residents of this area than there were when that PUD was enacted. The road is to up uh, 164th is essential. The commissioners know that for any number of reasons. The applicant stubbornly refused previously to make any commitment with respect to that road and refuses to make that commitment today. All you have heard is that when and if we ever seek to plat more land in this section, 
when and if we go north. Then we will deal with the issue of the road. No commitment to, to do anything. Um, and that, of course, has been a sticking point with this commission. We also know, and I believe in my letter brief to the commission, I mentioned the traffic realities that we face here. Uh, the traffic study that the applicant itself commissioned uh, was reviewed by the city's traffic management division. The traffic impact analysis was prepared by Cobb Engineering Company. That study considered the intersections at Northwest 150th Street with Remington Way, or Drive A, and with Monticello Drive, or Drive B. What this portends, if it were built out, is traffic would be dumped out of Lone Oak East onto Northwest 150th Street, directly across from the entrance to Remington. The situation, and we will put evidence in the record to substantiate this, the situation is intolerable now with a two-way road, and uh, to put this many homes in would make it even worse. The traffic study says that if it were to be built, uh, the street would be projected to operate at a level of service, LOS, the engineers call it D, when all 356 lots are developed. Your traffic management division said this is unacceptable, unacceptable not in conformance with the LOS of at least C for arterials in the urban growth area depicted in the OKC plan. In my view, C is bad enough. D is disastrous. Cobb Engineering recommended installation of a traffic signal at Drive A and Remington Way. Obviously needed. Needed now. Uh, and uh, there's no commitment on the developer uh, made to you today to do anything about that traffic signal. In the past, the developer has said, well, maybe we'll pay half of it, suggesting that the city should pay the other half. The problem is there's no program in place for the city to play the other, pay the other half. It's not on the CIP. Uh, at one point, they said, well, Remington, how about you pay half of it? Well, we can't afford it. So the traffic signal is out and is not a part of this preliminary plat. So what it amounts to is, under this scheme, everything dumps out to 150th. Uh, where the situation is already uh, a public safety problem. Um, there have been representations made in the past about how things are going to improve. I sent out a short letter brief yesterday, I believe, in which we repeated the remarks of a staffer here with the city, uh, city bond program manager, Ahmad Lasani. And here's what he told my client, and I'll tell you in case some of you didn't get the letter. If there's any questions about this, of course, you can call Ahmad and ask him. Ask him to come up. On Northwest 50th Street, the widening is divided into Project 1 and Project 2. Neither project is actually funded. Neither has any specific priority rating. Project 1 is under design. Project 2 has not yet commenced design. The construction of Project 1 wouldn't begin before 2015, there's no assurance that it would even start that year. To begin by mid-2015, the widening would need top priority, must be funded no later than 2015. Even then, it would not begin for some time. Right-of-way acquisition would take six to nine months. Utilities would consume at least one and a half years. Estimated construction time from start to finish would be about one year. That's information from the city. That makes this development premature. The city has had great experience in developing land, both residential and commercial, where there was no infrastructure in place to deal with the things those developments cause, and that includes flooding, traffic, and other issues. In response to uh, Mr. Haupt's remarks, uh, he says the uh, flood study is no longer an issue. I know the Commission has reservations about the extent to which it feels it has jurisdiction over flood issues. Uh, I won't bother you with it today, but I think there's plenty of authority in the subdivision regulations that suggest that that's something the Commission can pay attention to. We have a, a, a critique of the flood study underway. It is not complete. Our engineer is not able to say that it will flood and not able to say that it won't flood. But it still is an issue, but it is an issue that I believe we will take up with city staff and not with the Commission.
Mr. Half said, spoke of the imposition of a requirement that 164th be promised in this plat. I don't regard it as an imposition. I regard it as a condition and a reasonable one. Um, he says that to impose this condition shuts down this development and is a complete denial of the use of that property. Now, you, you all know those are code words. Those are code words for inverse condemnation. That's what he's threatening you with. He's saying that if you don't give me what I want today, I'm going to go to court and say that you took my land. Well, let me assure you he'll never gain an inch on that theory. This is not inverse condemnation. You are not taking the viability of this property away from him. And that's what the Supreme Court requires for a regulatory taking. You have to deprive the owner of all viable economic utility. He can build on this land as soon as he complies with your subdivision regulations. It's just not that hard. So you're not taking away the use of the land. As for neighbors, he says they're not here and they haven't expressed their protest. They're not here because I didn't want to make this hearing any longer than it needed to be, number one. Number two, there are literally hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of signatures on file in this case. So I would say yes, those signatures are in protest and they have expressed themselves. As far as making it personal is concerned, I got something to say about that. A couple of years ago when all this began, Mr. Haupt, who just spoke, wrote a letter to my client, Ginny Mason, sitting back there, is going to speak to you. I sent each of you a copy of that letter. And what Mr. Haupt said in that letter to Ginny was, I am going to sue you for slander, libel, tortious interference, and everything else I can think of if you continue to lead this protest. Now, if any of you don't remember getting that letter, I'll be glad to send it to you again. That's pretty personal from my point of view. That's how this thing got started, threatening to sue Ginny. So yeah, if, any, if it was personal, it was Mr. Haupt who made it personal. Now, I want to put in the record some facts about traffic on the ground from Ginny, and that'll be the end of our presentation. Ginny? My name is Jenny Mayasian, uh, 14405 Fossil Creek Lane, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Remington edition. Probably very tired of seeing me, and I'm sorry for that, but much shorter today. Um, I just want you to know that the, the remarks I'm about to make are matter of facts, which I know to be correct from my own personal knowledge. The traffic on Northwest 150th, west of Portland, is very, very congested and is continually increasing in congestion. Uh, it's, it blocks, almost completely blocks Monticello, passes Monticello's entrance many times in the morning. It goes close to Remington. I've never witnessed it going across Remington, but I've, um, it comes very close. The intersection right now at Northwest 150th in Portland is unreasonably backed up from all directions from uh, I think the only one that's probably not that I haven't witnessed being backed up is the westbound on 150th coming up to Portland but all three other directions are extremely congested Monticello is facing extreme unsafe conditions currently as they try to um, enter and exit their neighborhood probably even more so than Remington, because they have to um, uh, go, ex enter and exit with Remington's traffic included into the traffic that Remington Express um, has to deal with. The exits out of the neighborhood have been reported to be um, unsafe and a little bit treacherous for people even currently going to school. Additional traffic on there is feared to make it um, unsatisfactory and unsatisfactorily dangerous for going making left turns to school. 
I spoke, spoke with Ahmad Lasani. I b hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I believe he's the program bond manager. And Mr. Groves repeated um, those, com those comments that um, I believe I have reported them factually in there. And um, he put in a letter to you. And I, I know these are, are true. If there's any errors, they are very, very minor. And I, I believe they are totally factual. So, um, and can be verified with Mr. Lasani. So we, we appreciate you listening and caring about us. Okay, we have several more people. We've got a list here. Uh, Sharon McMinn or Kern McMinn. Okay. Paul Thiel. Dale and June Crumey. Barbara and Fred Brown. Okay, thank you. You're up. Mr. Yokel, and I'll, I'll try to just address some of the points that have been made without bringing up a lot of new stuff. It's been said that we have not made commitments, that we have not committed to build that traffic light. That is absolutely untrue, and as everyone who was at this meeting two weeks ago heard, here is our commitment. We said, and this is on the record, we said that we will immediately pay 50% of that traffic light, period, period, period. And if the city can find the funds for the other half, that's there, that will be done. Second of all, we said, if we get 80% through this project, we'll pay for, and it's still not up, we'll pay for 100% of that light. That's a commitment we've made on the record. It's part of our proposal, part of our application. Second of all, the old application is not before this commission. But a, I statement, understand that. but a statement was made that we we never made a commitment then to build that road. That's not true. All the commissioners will, I think, remember that we committed 100 percent when we got to a point specific, whether there was a traffic study or not that were suggested it was needed, we would build it no matter what. We had also com committed that at a lower point we would commission a new traffic study, and if it were needed, we would then build it. But I'm only bringing that up because that was was brought up before the commission. Back on these level of services, C is what the city's goal is. And the city staff agrees with the Cobb report, appears to agree, appears to accept the Cobb report, Cobb engineering report, that says with these plans that are in place on road construction, on turn lanes, on street lights, and with these expectations and projections of the development of this project, that five years from now when this is developed, these lots are going to all be developed today, and they're certainly not going to have houses built on them today, and they're not going to be occupied today. But when this is projected to be developed, we'll be at a level of service B. That is good. D is considered acceptable in national standards and in industry standards. B is considered very good. A would be there's no traffic at all. We're talking about what are the facts? What is the evidence that's before the commission right now? If we're not going to listen to the staff report and the staff recommendation, why are they here? If we're not going to listen to the traffic studies, and we've had now three um, that have been prepared and paid for, then why do we require them to be done? These are the facts. Well, I mean, while you've made that point, let me ask you if there's a staff report and a recommendation for approval or denial or whatever, why are we here? I mean, we're here to make the final decision based upon not only the staff report, which was prepared, as you know, by the end of last week, but also based on everything that we learned today from you and from everyone else, just so you understand. Yes, Mr. Yoko, again, a fair question. Most of the time I would suggest it's not black and white. Most of the time, there are caveats and there are issues out there. Here, we have a completely unchallenged, completely unchallenged staff report and staff recommendation. The only challenge is someone's saying, and with all due respect, there's a lot of traffic out here and I don't like it. There's also a challenge that says 
that there's a, an ongoing critique of the flood study. Well, this, this question's been before this commission for 22 months, and right now the federal government has said this is acceptable. The city has said not acceptable to the developer, acceptable to the city. So the city qualifies for the, to participate in the flood uh, program. This isn't about litigation. We want to begin developing lots, just as we have, just as my clients have for 25 years. And if we'll approve, if this commission will approve it, we'll start working on all of these things we've proposed right away. And we think that is positive, not just for us, but for the community. It's been suggested, I have to address this, that somehow we're not in conformity or we're, we're in violation of some subdivision regulation. That's not true. There's no regulation that's been pointed to that we're somehow in violation of. So once again, and then I will sit down. Commission, thank you for your time. Thank you for your consideration. But we're saying we want to develop. We believe we've played by all the rules of the PUD, of the subdivision regs, of FEMA, of the city staff, that there is nothing that we have not complied with and that we've submitted a very clean application, probably as clean as we'll ever be able to submit. And if this is denied, we have no other use for this property. And that's a fact. That's not legal argument. That's just the way it is. So again, we ask approval of our application. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners? I have a uh, question. The, this is a procedural legal question, too. Susan? The existing PUD, which encompassed the whole of whatever, this area, okay? PUD 706. In other words, there's been preliminary plat filed on that, was denied, gone across the street to the district court, was denied, and is now on appeal to the Supreme Court. That denial is now on appeal, okay? Now, this now is a portion of the land that is the subject of that appeal that's pending before the Supreme Court. So my question then is this. Assuming uh, the developer wins their appeal, right? then you have an existing, and we approve this case. What is the effect of the approval of this final plat, not preliminary, but a final plat? How does that dovetail with, because this, I, I don't know if this is just a carve out of the existing plat. There's some variances, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, oh, we just cut off a piece and we glue the other one back on top. So procedurally, my question is, how does that work? Well, I, I have not been involved in the application, <laughs> but I think this is a new application. So I think this would be viewed separately and apart from the what's yes, and I, and I can I'd like to answer that. As well, as it as is, as I, I, I know you would. Uh, <laughs> of course you would. I get that. Um, but my point is then, if I agree this is a separate application, but then do we have the other plat and all its PUD, all, all its conditions, et cetera, with respect to road, traffic, uh, those, how do the two dovetail? Does that one go away? It's not gonna go away procedurally if the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court says, no, no, Planning Commission and City, you were wrong. The developers were right. They get that deal. So then what do we get? Well, now we have some sort of hodgepodge. I just, I don't know how I circle that square. From a, from a development standpoint. We have two lawyers at least who want to answer that. I Maybe. might be able to. Plus, plus Susan. We got two, three sitting up here, so. <laughs> Well, I'll see what they have to say. I would rather have Dan answer that question since he's been involved in the litigation because I have not seen what's gone on in that case as far That's as fair. 
Uh, Ms. Randall, I think the answer I'd suggest to you is probably a common sense one. That right now, the issue that it's is on appeal is beyond the 355. In fact, there was no controversy on the first 379, what was going to be done, the phases one and two previously. I, I, I don't know that I would agree with the statement that there was no controversy. I, I'll just say that, but okay. please go ahead. But anyway, the issue that's on appeal is whether the collector road has to be built on prop once it exceeded, reached or exceeded 379 lots. We're within that here. We're lower than that. So our position and our belief is that it doesn't make anything to do with the appeal moot because that's only dealing with the upper parts of the property. But then what does that do to the commission if it were to come back successfully? It would be the same as if there was any other material change in land, topography, traffic, anything between the time of the preliminary plat and the final plat. And that would be something that would have to be addressed by the developer if it chose to pursue it or not, chose to proceed or not. So that, that's why we think what happens in that doesn't have anything to do, any, have any consequential effect on the approval of the 355 lots that are before the commission. Uh, frankly, I, I, A, I don't know that I agree with your legal interpretation. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's kind of a no harm, no foul. We can set that aside for a separate conversation. It's not my, it's not my role here. But I do have that, that, that question. And if it only deals with the road, um, I find that difficult to swallow, I mean, to be clear on. I mean, it's not a question of whether it's difficult to swallow or not. It's a question of whether I, just procedurally how we work, because then it seems to me I've, I've, I've got a Supreme Court affirmed plat and this one that I'm just, I'm just concerned procedurally later on down the road. I just have to, I have to highlight that because that, that does, Setting aside the land use and the discussion with respect to the road, this particular development, et cetera, I think that's a legitimate procedural question that I, I, I don't know the answer to. Uh, let's hear Eric's. Eric's got a comment, too, since he was involved in that litigation. Thank you, uh, Groves, for the protestants. <clears throat> Procedurally, here's what happened. The applicant here, dissatisfied with the result in the previous case, exercised his right for judicial review in the Oklahoma County District Court. The statutes are such that it is a review on the record, as opposed to a trial de novo. In other words, no new trial. When you appeal from the Board of Adjustment, you get a new trial, but not from this commission. So everything that was put before the commission went to the District Court. Mr. Brummett and I wrote briefs. Mr. Halp submitted briefs. And the court reviewed those, and we had extensive oral argument. There were some procedural obstacles along the way. I won't trouble you with those. At the end of the day, uh, we argued that the commission's decision should be upheld for several reasons. First of all, because the official minutes of the commission said that the traffic infrastructure wasn't in place to handle this development. And second, that fire response times would be adversely impacted. That's what your minutes said. Your transcripts reflected a, a, a significant debate about connecting to 164th Street. And the judge's ruling was, whether she based it on the minutes or the transcripts, was your decision was not arbitrary. It was a reasonable decision. Uh, the applicant has appealed that decision to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. Now, in the ordinary course of things, your, the Oklahoma Supreme Court assigns these cases to our intermediate appellate court, the Court of Civil Appeals. There is a modest body of case law from the Court of Civil Appeals with my name on it and Dan Brummett's name on it and Dennis Fox's name on it, cases we've had about these issues before. The likely outhood is, outcome is now, Brummett and I thought about asking the Supreme Court to retain this case filing a motion to retain and saying, don't send it down to the Court of Civil Appeals. Decide it yourself. We haven't done that yet. Chances are that the Court of Civil Appeals will look at the prior cases involving platting and make a decision as to whether or not the trial court was correct. And that's what's before the appellate courts. Did Judge Davis make the right decision in upholding you or not? 
Now, this case is a new case. I believe that my opponent is setting the commission up for an appeal. He structured this presentation. He wants to do it all over again. If he does, it would be a different case, a different judicial review of what is before you in this case. In the case that's on appeal, the record is closed. Nothing that happens here is going to be a part of that record, Mike. I don't, I don't think that's over and done with. Uh, and nothing that happens in this, in that case, is impacts on this, except in uh, some very subtle ways. So there are two separate cases. If you deny this plat, which we ask you to do, then the the applicant can make a decision. Do I want to take this one to the district court, like I did the last one, or not? I strongly suggest to you that, given the circumstances, uh, the result at the district court level would probably be the same. A denial would be upheld in this case. So I hope that's responsive to the question. It's not exactly. The question is not what impact our decision will have on that process. The question is what impact that process will have on the previous decision made here. Yeah. And if, it is, if it's overturned by the Supreme Court, the decision of the district court in our decision, and they are, in effect, granted approval of their original plat application, how would that impact You're this right. case if we approve it or if we deny it? You're right. I didn't answer Does that. one or the other supersede the other? The simple fact that he's filed this one subsequently, does that mean that he's abandoning the outcome of that case? No, I don't think so. I don't think so either. <laughs> I, think, I think, and I should have answered your question, and I didn't, but what I did say was that when the Court of Civil Appeals issues its opinion, as it has done in several other platting cases. The rules of law that they announce in that opinion will bind the commission. Now, I don't know what they're going to say. They're probably nine months to a year from saying anything at all. So I don't think the commission should, should be influenced by that appellate process in its decision in this case. There's no way to tell what they'll say, Commissioner. You know, I, I mean, I, I think the trial court will be upheld, but I... I think there'll be an opinion, a written opinion, as there have, has been in the past, and then we'll provide guidance to the commission. Mr. Bright, did you have something or not? You were. I'm as confused as anybody about what you know, exactly your question, Janice. But just I'm prepared to cut to the chase. You know, our job here today is to review the application and to make a decision on. The merits of it. You know, go, go ahead. I, I was going to say the, the other procedural question I think that's on the table and that I'm finding confusing is that I can't remember a time since I've been sitting here that we have entertained a final plat when we have denied the preliminary plat. I mean, why are we even looking at this? I don't. Can we do this? Do we have the authority to to uh, entertain to vote yes or no? Could we approve the, the final having denied the preliminary? It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, uh, yeah. that's the question. And I, I believe this is an area that Mr. Groves and I probably agree on because he made a remark at the last commission meeting that the preliminary, and I don't believe I'm mischaracterizing this, Mr. Groves, that, that this is the vote that ultimately decides. The, pre the preliminary application is just that, and it's giving, based on the information that's before the commission, then it again reviews it on its in its final form, and that's the decision that matters. So we think whatever but happened there... Although, we, although we do occasionally approve or deny final plans, very occasionally uh, deny final plans after approving a preliminary plan because something is not being done in accordance with it, or we've changed our mind about what the criteria will be if so much time has gone by since the preliminary was presented, something like that. I can't ever remember us even looking at a final plat where we've denied the preliminary. And I, I'm not sure I agree that that just doesn't count. I, didn't, I don't think it doesn't count. I don't believe it doesn't count. But there were a couple things that did change um, between the preliminary, the time of Today. One, because of the late hour, frankly, there were only five, four of you weren't here because it was 8 o'clock in the evening, 8.15 in the evening. Second of all, there was the question that arose as to the fire response. 
And that came up at the very, well, within the last few minutes of that hearing. And there was a question whether or not, by not developing all the way to 164, that it was going to interfere with the fire department's ability to respond timely to a call in Lone Oak East. And that's why we submitted the exhibit that we did, again, demonstrating emails with the fire department saying that whether it comes from the south, the north, we're talking seconds, and it doesn't have an effect. That's why And, and what, what I hear you answering is, is, you know, should we entertain it? The question I'm asking, I guess, our legal counsel is, can we entertain yeah. it? Are we, are we comfortable procedurally with doing it this way? Yes, I think you can, can look at the final plat that's before you. Okay. I, I don't get it either, Janice. Why isn't this a, a preliminary plat? Because we turned it down. Can, can I get a shot at Well, and they'd already filed but their this final. This would be an appeal of a preliminary plat. No, they'd already filed it. It's in, it was in the mix. With, if, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, I'll try to yes. be brief. A preliminary plat is a planning tool that we use here at the city to flush out all of the issues that arise when land's being platted. It has no legal force or effect. Okay? But we do it for good practical reasons. The final plat is what counts. And the final plat has a statute that governs it that says you've got to accept it or reject it in 30 days or the law will deem it to be approved. So there's a difference between preliminary platting and final platting, and that's a key difference. So if the question is, does the denial of the preliminary plat play a role in the denial of the final plat, the answer is you're not bound by your decision on the preliminary plat, but it's pretty hard to ignore intellectually is how I see it. If I were sitting there, I'd say, I'm not going to approve a final plat when I denied the preliminary plat, but I don't think you're bound by your decision on the preliminary plat. Nick, do you want to say something? Well, just a couple of things. Uh, as to the fire, Brian Kuhn called me yesterday and told me about talking with the fire marshal, uh, what they said. So I, uh, I went down and met with the uh, deputy fire marshal. We called Major Williams, who this email is from. And uh, the difference between now and 22 months ago is we were, on a, uh, we were on a card system back then, and the system was set up on a grid system, which I argued with them at the time uh, because this entrance was across the street from Remington, but at, on, under the old card system, Remington was served by Station 3 on MacArthur, and Lone Oak would have been served this section of Lone Oak would have been served by Section 37 on Pennsylvania. That's where that response time came from. Now, under the GPS system, assuming everybody's at home, all the stations are manned, they go based on an address. And as was explained to me, literally, you could have two houses next door to one another first in from one station to one, first in to the, to the other, based on the GPS markers. Uh, the key, I think, on, on this deal was when I asked both of those guys the question, well, would you prefer to have access from 164th? The answer was obvious, of course. Matter of fact, Major Williams went on to say, I'd prefer to also have access from Portland. Uh, and we all intuitively know that. We've, we've heard enough from, from fire over the years. So, so the, this email is, is correct. Basically, they, they explained to me that there are literally seconds difference in response times from these three stations. Uh, so that's no longer the response time is not necessarily an issue. However, their preference would be to still have this connection. Chairman made a point about the, before we saw the entire section like we asked people to plat their entire property, this is piecemealed. And before we at least had a commitment that the road would be built, 
under this proposal, as council read, well, we'll extend the collector street north as we go. The chairman made a good point. If we stop 100 foot short of 164th street, there is no connection. Yesterday, Brian said, you know, it will, I can't in good conscience build a road into a floodplain and I don't know where, what the city's going to do with 164th street. That's true. Today we don't know. But as council just said, it's going to take them five years to build this out. In five years we will certainly know, we'll know in much less than five years, what 164 is going to do. And I can't believe that the 164th improvement that the city would build a road to a level in the floodplain. It's just not, you know, we just don't do that. So I, I don't think that's necessarily a, a valid point. The last thing uh, that I see here is nothing has changed. When we originally denied this, there was at least a commitment to 164th. You'll notice there was nothing mentioned today in all the presentation about getting kids to school. That's a big, big thing with this connection. That's still not here. When we heard the preliminary plat two weeks ago, again, nothing's changed from that. We denied it last time based on uh, the fact that there's no connection and no commitment to connection. I see nothing that has changed. I can't support it. Other comments, commissioners? I have a, a question. on. The signalization of 150th. So I understand. I, I, I thought you said that at 80 percent, you'd put in some signal, right? What well, we've said. I don't understand. I, I, I'm not clear what well, we, that means. Sure. What I, I think I've said, and what we said a couple of weeks ago is we'll commit today to pay for half of that signal. To Which one? The signal that's at the entrance to At Remington Island. Way? Yes. Okay. And then, but if for some reason it hasn't got in, the other half of the money hasn't come in, the city hasn't found a way to take our money, whatever, whatever happens, we've built in a backstop when we get to 80% completion. We're committing on the record unequivocally that we'll go ahead and pay to put that traffic signal. So before this development is, reaches that point of, of completion, construction, occupancy, that signal's going to be in. So that's 284 lots, 80% times. If, if that's what 80% is, by that number of lots, when they're developed, that light will be in no matter what. The other, you know, we've looked hard at that issue of getting to the schools. Keep in mind, the way we, you know, all, we anticipate that the residents of this development will go is they'll go down to 150th, that's the closest street. They'll turn right. They'll go up to Lone Oak Drive, turn north. Lone Oak Drive is a different street entirely than the street, the collector road that uh, was proposed to go through Lone Oak East. There's no driveways that abut it, that come out onto it. So it's just a clean street clean road that goes right up to 164th and they turn left and then they go into the school. So again, common sense is that's the way that people who live here, that these 355 homes will be, those who go to school will be going to school. So it just doesn't seem to make sense to any of us that they're going to go through uh, a neighborhood where there's driveways and that kind of additional traffic. The, uh, and again, back on the fire and all the, we're just trying to deal with the facts, and I'm looking right now at the staff report. The fire marshal did weigh in on this, and the fire marshal's office weighed in, said it had no adverse comments, and, and that's what we're trying to address, is just what we've been given and responded to. And, I, and that's all we know what to do. That's what's in front of us. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, I mean, I tend to agree with Commissioner Gales. Uh, I was here at 8 o'clock at night and voted as, in, in a denial. Uh, with the full review of all the facts and circumstances and all the issues that were presented, uh, I would like to have seen the flood study, this mysterious flood study you're talking about. I'd like to have seen what that is. But irrespective of that, I don't think the infrastructure is adequate for the development that you're proposing right now on 150th Street. The denial of paying for the signalization, which according to the protesters is needed today, paying half when the other half isn't available anywhere that you know about, uh, isn't enough. And so I would move to deny the application. Is that a second? Second. Commissioner, there's a motion to deny the application. Any additional discussion? Cast your votes. It is denied. On item 18, which is PUD 1504, an application by Trinity Baptist Church to rezone 624 North Cemetery Road from AA Agricultural and PUD 1038 to a new PUD 1504 in Ward 3. Good afternoon. I'm Hagen with Craft and Tone Associates, representing the applicant. I have with me an exhibit to kind of show you the uh, history of this property. In about 2005, Trinity Baptist Church obtained this 20 acres, uh, zoned it as a PUD with a C1 underlying zoning with the only uses could be associated with that church. Shire Lee came in after that, so the church was already existing. The remaining property up here has been owned by a group for since 2004. This property is what's being included in the Existing 20-acre PUD, wanting to combine them into one PUD for the overall church campus. The only uses that can be allowed in here is commercial uses associated with the church. It's important for the church to get this property because of visibility and uh, signage out on Cemetery Road. We are in agreement with all TEs, and <clears throat> if you have any questions on the application. Well, Phil, my first question is... Uh in September, we asked you to continue this item and meet with the neighbors. And I don't know, I've got about eight people signed up here. Um, so tell me what you did about meeting with the neighbors. Okay. In September, we got a, uh, maybe in the August meeting. I wasn't here. <clears throat> I got a, a lady's name, Kim Heaton. Did not get a number. Had to write her a letter to ask her to contact me because I could not find a number for her, which she did. We had a neighborhood meeting just prior to the September meeting, which we agreed to take continuance. At that meeting, uh, there was probably 25 neighbors there. We agreed to drop the, the duplex portion of this, and so I advised the PUD accordingly, sent it to Ms. Heaton, let her know to please review it and, and distribute it to her neighbors. She's the only point of contact that I made out of that meeting with, and the last time she was able to arrange the meeting, so I'd, I'd be happy to meet with them if anybody has any questions. And I did not get anything until yesterday, I believe. I got an email just saying they're disappointed that <clears throat> we didn't have a meeting. But I offered to have one. It wasn't contacted until yesterday. But I believe this is a straightforward application. It's a church complex, <clears throat> beautiful building. They're just expanding their uh, zoning to include all the property they're going to own. So I'd be happy to let them speak and address their concerns. Okay. Before you do that, can I ask you, um, why you feel the need to have animal raising commercial as a use that's allowed on the property? That is not one that we intended to have in there, and that was an oversight. Like I said, we agreed to the, all the TEs. I mean, inside the church right now, they have a coffee shop, a pastry shop, bookstore, and they, you know, their plans are to, in the future, add a 
church office. The offices right now are off-site, and they want to add a church office and potentially, you know, a, a expand their coffee shop where small groups can meet and have coffee and talk. And so. You know, I, I, I just have to say that my concern about, about applications like this are that, that it, it's very, um, oh, um, I'm, I'm, it's easy to sort of let a, a blanket of, of um, the applicant cover a multitude of uses that are not always tied so specifically. I understand what you're saying. I have no problem at all with that. They want a coffee shop, no problem. But I know I have voted for those kinds of uses as part of an office complex or as part of a, even a, a, an expansion on a, on a church site. But then, you know, well, we, we decided we don't need that property or we're relocating, we're selling this property. And that use, which is tied to the zoning, becomes something different, something that's definitely part of that use unit description, but is not what was contemplated in the zoning. And so although, you know, I, I can understand not wanting to micromanage and everything, I really feel the need to tie those kinds of things down where they're, you know, strictly limited to internal use of the employees or the, you know, or the patrons of the church or, you know, some way that we have um, a comfort level that that's actually what's going to be done with it. Not only now, right. but in the future. In this PUD, we have specified as the clause in the PUD, all these uses can only be associated with this church. So they sell the property, they cannot, they have to rezone the property and come before you. You, is can, that, just, you is, can just describe them as accessory uses to the primary use of, of, the, of the church. And is that binding in, in, and, and functional for us, Susan? In a PUD, it would be. To, to limit those kind of uses if the property changes hands? Um, yeah, I think you could limit that in the PUD itself. Yeah. To specific. Make them accessory uses to the primary that was the intent of what we put in there. If it yeah. needs to be reworded, I mean, we'd be happy to agree to TE to word it more properly, but that's the intent of this PUD. It's this property is going to be part of the campus of the church and can be used for no other use. Okay. Well, Phil, we have a bunch of people signed up, so we'll just start with Kim Heaton. If you'd pull that time. down and give us your name and address, please. Kimberly Heaton. Thank you. Uh, 601 Shamrock Circle. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting us to, to participate today. Um, the concerns that you've expressed are the same concerns that we have. I'm sure that you've all seen that we filed some letters and some materials with information that we found out since the beginning uh, of this process. As you know, this is my third time to come back here and some of the other homeowners have been here more than once as well. Uh, originally, looking at an application that said they wanted senior housing and a church complex, but when you get into the conditions, the special conditions and the restrictions on the zoning, there's no restrictions there for a church complex. There's no restrictions there for, for senior housing. So I came to the meeting. I was one of the few people that got the notice that came to the meeting, and sure enough, they announced that they had no intentions of building senior housing. They were going to build duplexes. Um, another, another thing about the first application is it said it was Trinity Baptist Church property, and we've learned since then it, it was not all Trinity Baptist Church property, and it was not all Trinity Baptist Church development. Um, in fact, I provided some deeds and some county records showing the ownership of that land, and the part that's been dropped off up there, I believe, uh, if I'm reading the deeds correctly, that that portion was owned by Gobi LLC of Mustang. Uh, and there are other portions of the property that they're proposing to develop in front of the church that are also owned by Gobi LLC as well as Trinity Baptist Church. That's what the first application said. The second amended application now says they want a church complex and they want sports Fields, and they've got nice drawings of how nice it's going to look. I agree, it looked promising. But again, when you get into the specifics in the actual amended application, the restrictions are not there. 
The only thing there is that's the concept. There's nothing there saying only church coffee shop. The only thing that I could find in restrictions said they wouldn't build drive-in fast food within 150 feet of our properties. That wasn't very comforting. I, I, I felt we could probably hear them say, would you like fries with that drink from our yards? And they also said they wouldn't build gasoline stations or convenience facilities within 150 feet. Well, we've covered those things now. You understand that? Where? They're uh, not listed as the uses allowed in the PUD, and we're going to limit the uses to accessory to the primary use, which is church. Is that going to be amended in the future? It's going to be amended today. Today? That's what we were discussing. And so it will just be a coffee shop, bookstore, facility type for the church complex? And, and many churches today have those. They'll have their own bookstore. They'll have their own coffee shop. Uh, that's a very common feature in churches today. Right. I, I believe they already have a coffee shop inside the church. I don't know about a bookstore, but... Well, but the um, zoning will limit that type of a use to the church only. What that means is if the church goes away, the use goes that with use it. goes away. I see. And so you'll amend it today to we're say do, that? We're, we're, we're doing that today. Right. We've, okay. we've already that's, talked to uh, that's Phil And that will prevent like private citizens from coming on the property as encompassed in the original? Not, I mean, not just literally, to get not literally, my coffee but, at the coffee shop? or It won't be open to the public. It won't be open to the public. That was my question. It'll be I realize their church members are going to come. Maybe. It's going to be in church. On Sunday, it'll be open to the public. Well, <laughs> in, the way, in the way a commercial yeah. bus got it. Well, we're getting way, we're, get, we're kind of wandering around here. Uh, churches, churches I don't are think open. so, Mr. Chairman. I, churches, I mean, I think she's, me. she's wanting to know how we are going to define it in such a way that they have an enforceable commitment that the use will truly be limited to the church and its patrons, and, and um, I think that's reasonable. Well, but a church is, a, is open to the public. the public. When it's open on Sunday, it's open to the public. Now, that's right. I'm not going to go there instead of Starbucks for my coffee if I'm not a church member. It's going to be internal to the church. The bookstore is internal to the church. They'll be selling religious tracts associated with their particular faith. Uh, it's not going to be full circle bookstore or borders. Uh, that's not how church, churches use these facilities. And these will be accessory uses to the church. Right. But if someone says, is it open to the public? A church is open to the public. Your church is, my church is. Right. They are. Right. Uh, so the literal answer is yes. That's the when the church is open and the bookstore is open, they're open to the public. As a practical matter, is the public going to seek out their coffee and donut there rather than daylight donuts or uh, Starbucks? The answer is no. So, I mean, I, you're going to get a lot of comfort from what we're doing. This yeah. will be uses connected with the functions commonly associated with a church. I appreciate that, and I I, uh, I want you to understand where we're coming from, and I, I think I can speak on behalf of some of the other homeowners as well. We've been told so many stories and so many different things that didn't turn out to be true that we don't know what to believe anymore, and all we know is we need to see it in writing. Well, we're going to nail those kinds of things down today, and it's not uncommon uh, for us to see an application where things change. An applicant owns property and might have additional property under contract yeah. that is going to be, that is incorporated right. as a part of an application today. So the court record may show that John Jones owns, you know, a quarter acre somewhere in this site, but the church obviously intends to own that and use it for church purposes. So uh, that also is not uncommon. I hope we're kind of putting you at ease here. I feel much better. It's, uh, it's also not uncommon for the application itself to change, to sort of evolve as it goes through this process, as they get comments from neighbors, as they get comments from staff, as they get comments from around the horseshoe about things they want to see, either different or just more specific. 
And so, I mean, the fact that it's, to, me, to you, it may sound like the story keeps changing, and, and it may be that it is, in the sense that it is, it's evolving as it goes through this process. And that's not unusual. And it's also how we wind up, hopefully, with a product that is better, better in the end and satisfies mm -hmm. not only the needs of the applicant, but also concerns that uh, neighbors may have. So, I mean, that's why it's a process. And I can't speak on behalf of the neighbors as far as this, but I'm not concerned about a coffee shop that doesn't have a driver through window and isn't positioned to serve the public off the street as much. I'm not as concerned about that. In fact, I could see, you know, how that could work on that church property. I'm certainly not opposed to sports fields, and if they would like to put that in writing as well, we would, we would love that, because I think that would be a very nice use right next to our neighborhood. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Leonard Mutz. My name is Leonard Moots, Sorry. 12804 Northwest 5th Street. The only thing I'd like to add, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much comforted by what you said, but we have had water issues out there pretty severe over the last couple of years. Marcia Slaughter's office is telling us that you're building a 30-inch main <clears throat> that will come out to Cemetery Road in 2018. And our water pressure will improve as we go toward 2018, but the inside is 2018. If we're not doing the multifamily dwellings, I'm less concerned. But if we continue to add houses out here that pull water, we need to consider our water main issues and try to accelerate those. In addition, traffic on Cemetery Road sounds like the discussion a while ago. Traffic on Cemetery Road, it's a two-lane road. It's getting bad out there. The engineering department tells me there may be a bond issue in 2017 or 2018 that could come up with money to fund turning that into a four-lane road. Traffic load is already sufficient to justify a four-lane road. So I'm not, I'm not opposed to going forward with what we have, from what the changes we've talked about. But there are some longer concerns that need to be considered as we go out in time. Well, tell your councilman you'd like a four-lane road there. That's mm -hmm. the fastest way to get some action. Thank you. Thank you. Tyler Yawns. Okay, thank you. Dino Foote. My name is Dino Foote. I live at 12712 Northwest 6th Street. Only thing I'd want to add is I, I'm a little distressed at the secrecy that's been going on with this whole thing. Uh, I'd hope in the future that that more than just one person in the neighborhood is getting contacted. If, if they're supposed to meet with the neighbors, that's plural. And I've never been contacted, and I've been in that neighborhood for a year. And I'm just it just distresses me that this thing's kind of been wanting uh, it, it, it appears as, as, it, as if it's trying to be ramrodded through without really a whole lot of discussion, hoping we don't find out about it. That's just my personal opinion, but that's what it appears to be. So. Well, I, apparently there was a neighborhood meeting with about 25 people in the town. I was there, but I heard it from the one person that got contacted, and she was just diligent enough to, to get the word out. But Trinity Church and Gobi should have been one getting the word out. Well. I think. City requires notice. There's an ordinance in terms of what the radius for notice is, and I'm sure that was complied with. I mean, I can't. We so there's only one person who's in the, the I, radius? I, okay. I'm, I'm just trying to yeah, share with you. I, I, mean, I, I don't know that. It's just frustrating. I mean, I'm a homeowner out there, too, and I have to feel the impact of, of whatever they do on that property, whether it's fast food or whether it's a coffee shop or a bookstore or a sports field. We have to deal with the traffic on Cemetery Road, and we have to deal with the water pressure, and we have to deal with the added number of just people around. And if I'm not told about that so that I can voice my concern, it distresses me just a little bit. So I understand and Thank share you. your concern. Thank you. Thank you. 
Sir? May I say one thing about if you'll come to the microphone, this is recorded and people wouldn't hear you if you okay. About the meeting that they said that they had with us, both meetings were actually handled the same by Kraft and Tall. The first meeting, they contacted me because I was the sole person at the meeting on, in August. And they contacted me by, by mail, and I supplied the copy of their letter that said they didn't know how to reach me. I found that a little hard to believe since I live next door to the church. But they didn't send that letter to anybody else in my neighborhood, just me. And I know that for a fact because I've talked to every single one of them. I went door to door, and I talked to every neighbor that was home, and I left information for each one of them. The second time you directed them to meet with the neighbors to alleviate their concerns about this application, Mr. Mr. Hagan called me on October the 2nd, last week, and said, do you have any questions? Do you need to meet with me? And I said, about what? And he said, about the amended application. And I said, well, I haven't looked at it yet. I'd gotten a copy from from your planning department, but I hadn't had a chance to go all the way through it yet. And he said, well, if you have any questions and have to meet with me, let me know. That was it. Now, again, I've talked to about 40 of the neighbors because I'm not an email person, which I'm regretting a lot because I'm having to go door to door. But they didn't get that inquiry. No one's received anything from Kraft and Toll in my neighborhood except me. I seem to be the only greasy wheel here that they are approaching about this issue. And that puts the burden on me to go out to all of my neighbors, and that isn't right. And they're upset about it because when they hear it from me, they say, well, why didn't they contact us? Well, it's because I agree with what the other homeowners just said. I don't think there's a real interest in contacting the neighbors. I don't think they have any interest in talking to us at all. Okay. Thank you. Ron Duncan. Thank you for your very valuable, t valuable time. My name is Ron Duncan. I live at 12812 Northwest 6th Street. Uh, to this point, and I've listened to a couple of the people that came out to explain what they was going to do, and I am overwhelmed with deception. I have not gotten anything from the people that came out. Uh, one young man came out. Uh, he didn't even know who he was representing, whether it was Gobi or the church. Uh, to, to, to get away from that, uh, what I came for is we've got an overwhelming traffic problem on Cemetery Road. Uh, from 7 o'clock in the morning, trying to get on Cemetery Road, you might as well go back home and sleep till 9 o'clock. Uh, 5 o'clock to 4 o'clock till 6.30, same thing. Wednesday night, Wednesday morning, you can't even travel down Cemetery Road. I, I think we need to go back and approach this thing on, we've got lots of problems out there already. Why compound them? Uh, I have property in another city that's next to a sports complex, and I can't hire enough people after a softball game to clean up their trash. That's what will happen there. Um, as far as being notified, I understand, and maybe I'm wrong, it is state law that if you're within 300 feet of a rezoning area that the people within 300 feet at least be notified. I was not notified and I know of nine other people that was within that area that was not notified by the city, the church, or anybody else. I think we need to postpone this thing for that very reason. Nobody knew about it. You know, it's, it's just overwhelming. We've got people that spent over $20 million in this addition to have nice housing and stuff. You folks, uh, the city of Enid, or the city of, I came from Enid, so I get mixed up here a little bit. Uh, the city of Oklahoma City gets over twenty-five or $250,000 in taxes annually. The, the uh, housing development is half full. If this is detrimental to the housing and there's no more houses built in there, Oklahoma City is going to lose more than $250,000 in taxes. You know, why can't we, you know, nobody's told us what they're doing yet. 
You know, to all we see is commercial buildings that we don't know what's going to do, what they're going to do with. Uh, we see a sports complex. What are they going to What are they going to use in their sports complex? Soccer, football, baseball. Is it going to be lighted? Are going to have bleachers? Are we going to be spending all night out there listening to mamas and daddies screaming? You know, we've got a nice, quiet neighborhood. Neighborhood, I think, that needs to have some thought put into it before we make a decision. You know, this this is terrible for our neighborhood, and we're not we're not trying to be tough on the church. We're just trying to find out what's going on. If we'll sit down with the church, who we have not been able to do so far, uh, maybe we can work out something that will be good for all of us. So far, this is not good for us. You know, this is going to turn into an addition where nobody else cares about coming in and building. We've already got a problem at our entrance of people running off of a two-lane road that's probably 100, 150 foot deep or long that's that deep at the edge of the road. What's it going to do at the church? It's going to do the same thing at the church. I've called the city of Oklahoma City three times. They come out and put a pylon down in the hole. Next day they come out and pick up the pylon. Somebody's going to get killed there, and if we could keep doing that all the way down uh, Cemetery Road, you're going to get a lot of people hurt because nobody's worried about fixing it. I understand that in the future there's a four-lane road going to be through there. Why don't we wait till the four-lane road's through there? Why don't we fix something before we add more trouble to it? And I know you guys are, and ladies are tired of hearing complaints and stuff, but we've got some complaints that needs to be addressed before we start pouring concrete. You know, this, this, isn't, this isn't right. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, and I'm not going to get your name correctly, so I'm going to apologize in advance. Okay, thank you. Phil? Sir? I apologize. I may have missed you. Let me look. Well, come up in any case. I'm sorry. I found you. I had you buried in here. I apologize. That's all right. My name is James Cross. I live at 609 Shamrock Circle. Many of the comments that I originally signed up to speak about have been covered. I'm instead going to change my comments, make them very brief. I'm sure you'll be thankful for that. Um, there are several of us in this neighborhood that uh, have gone to not only money expense but time expense to be here. I have a father with dementia. I have a sick animal at home. I'm paying somebody to take care of that while I'm here. So this isn't a frivolous thing with a bunch of troublemongering neighbors. Um, we're all here for a variety of reasons. We may express ourselves a little differently, a little more or less coherently, depending on what our emotions are running at the time. Um, you have my letter that I sent to you. I'm not going to bother you with going through a lot of those issues. Some of them are similar to or the same as what have already been, what's already been heard. But something that I have chosen to address now is um, I've heard of, I've been writing some notes, I've been listening to this. I heard um, this comment about animal raising. And I heard Mr. Hagan's comment about, well, that's just, that's an oversight. I have been involved with the safety profession with code enforcement issues for almost 20 years. When you approach an authority having jurisdiction such as this body, I would expect if I were conducting that business that I would have my ducks in a row, I would have my information correct. Um, I wouldn't expect to have a trail of unhappy people behind me wondering what's going on. and. Any parent will tell you not to reward bad behavior. And I'm going to be very blunt, and I'm going to say that if after everything is said, and even though you're in good faith trying to make some allowances to us for some modifications, I have watched the progression of this document based on the things that have been submitted to the City of Oklahoma City, things I've pulled from the website. 
And to hear statements that this is going to be restricted to church use, that isn't clear in the documents. And for that to come all the way here with two continuances, and now here we are again today, and now it's come down to you're having to specify that. Why are you doing the job of the applicant and the applicant's representative? They should have their ducks in a row. They should be the ones to contact us. We should not have to receive partial information from them and then go out. The reason we go out and try and talk to the neighbors is to protect our best interests. It didn't appear to me that anyone involved with this on the applicant's side was interested in that. They seem to think it's sufficient just to do a cursory, well, we tried to contact someone and, uh, you know, if I had ever done that when I worked with the state fire marshal's office, I, I wouldn't have been able to survive that in terms of my professional career. You don't handle things in a haphazard manner like that. Um, it also disturbs me that, you know, I heard the comment about if, if the church goes away, then the use restrictions go away. So. If Gobi LLC that owns part of this, if the church decides not to, to take any of that and develop that, does that mean that Gobi LLC will then be left with this broad, comprehensive commercial uh, that they can then do what they want to? It's unclear to me is why I'm asking the question. And so I would suggest, and the gentleman before me brought some issues, um, there are a lot of things here that I would expect to see in a PUD. I would expect to see things specific to lighting and noise, all of these things related to the use. To me, the documents aren't that clear. And so I would encourage you not to reward bad behavior. I would encourage you not to allow this thing to move forward as it is without this being a very clear, very straightforward document, a very clear and straightforward process, one that's very clear up front, who is the applicant, who is acting on whose behalf, exactly what is going on, exactly what is going to be done. That's why we're all here stirred up like a bunch of wet hornets, because it's not clear what we hear and what we read don't match up in our, in our estimation. So we're not intentionally trying to be troublemakers, but we're not understanding and it seems to me that if this had been handled more precisely and would have been handled more accurately and more straightforwardly on the part of the developer and the applicant, this wouldn't have gotten to this point where this is such a, an issue with us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that sounds almost like a motion to me. What kind of motion? Denial? I think that clean up, Bill needs to get with the neighbors, clean this up, come back with a document that reflects the kinds of things that we've raised today and the things that the neighbors have raised. And you need to find a way to reach those people and sit down with them. That is <clears throat> what you're asking is already in that document. I mean, so Bill, now, where's, hey, whether it's in the document or not, what I'm hearing is a number of folks walk up here. The last time we continued this, you had basic marching orders, get with the neighbors and meet and figure it out. That was obviously not successful for whatever reason. And I, I believe that's one of the things the chairman's referring to. I find that troublesome. Uh, I believe this application can work, but uh, it looks like you, need, you have some homework to do to me. I, I, I don't disagree with Commissioner Gaz. I have a couple of comments with respect to that. Additional comments that kind of go to specific portions of the uh, application. Um, one is um, the, the sports field use. Um, I think it's probably Good use, frankly. Yeah, uh, they already I, I, have sports fields, irrigated sports fields on the east end of the property. Are, they, are you changing that, though, with this PUD? The only concern I have about this, I'm, I don't have any problem with the use. I have a problem with hours of operation, potentially, and lighting as it, as, as it affects 
These are residential. Just, these are practice fields. I mean, they're not whole well, I mean, tournaments. Can you, or anything are like you going to light them at some time? There's, there's, I believe, wording in the PUD. You know, typical lighting wording in the PUD to protect residential. Well, I, it doesn't. It says the lighting plan in accordance with shall be submitted as part of the subsequent specific plan. Light but, sports fields aren't included in the PUD. So they can't it's have light sports. It's a separate use unit for light at sports fields. Okay, so they can't have that. Okay, that's thanks for that. Then that that probably a clears up both of those concerns. The area we're talking about rezoning doesn't even abut the Shire Lee subdivision. We've taken out the portion that abuts it. The area that abuts Shire Lee already has the, the zoning the in use. place. The church was there before Shire Lee. The area that we're talking about is north. There's a 4.6 acres between Shire Lee and, and 10 acres being added to the PUD. To the south. To the south. So they have a buffer of 4.6 acres between Shirley Edition and this 10 acres. And that's the part that you cover, that was part of it that's now kind of cut out. Correct. It looks like. You know, right. The first meeting we had one protester. This protest has kind of grown and grown and grown. Understood. I went to the meeting with them, and uh, it, was mo it was a very unpleasant meeting, hostile meeting. And I really, if I didn't have to meet with these folks again, it wouldn't hurt my feelings one bit. Um, I couldn't even speak at the meeting, so I just had to get up and walk out. I think we have a good application, and I'd ask that you hear it today and approve it. It's straightforward. What they're upset about is <clears throat> the notice that went out. You know, staff summarizes our application in a page. Well, they, they went through that, went through the PUD. There's some discrepancy because they summarize it. And from that, they're saying there's deception. Well, you know, there's I'm no deception going that on at here. All. It's a straightforward application. It's a church complex. Well, and I wasn't suggesting that either, but I'm looking at a graphic that shows an office building and retail building right out on uh, yeah, Cemetery the, Road. The church office and potentially a coffee shop. It's, I mean, it's, we have to bring what? back the coffee shop that we spoke about if they choose to do something like that. That's not what I mean by an ancillary use. Ancillary use for a coffee shop is one that's in the church. Same thing with a book, bookstore. Uh, also, I have a question for staff, Jojo. Under, um, on page 7, 9.19, it says specific plan and final plan. And I read this to say that no building permit shall be issued until um, a specific plan has been amended. Is this right? That uh, has been approved. But then the very next paragraph says, due to the solid landscaping, parking, blah, 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 blah. No, a specific plan is not required. Uh, that was a problem with their document. We have a TE that yeah, there's a TE clarifies that we do want a specific plan. So we, we are getting a specific yeah. plan. Actually, that, I, I really think, <clears throat> I think it would really behoove you to take some time here, uh, both around the horseshoe and with your neighbors, and uh, meet with them again. I'll be happy to make myself available if anybody wants to call on me to do that. Make sure that the specifics of this are nailed down, that they're comfortable with what they're getting. If they don't like it, they don't like it. But that the questions get answered and that we're comfortable with what is really being proposed here and that it's really nailed down, um, I, I think it'd be a good idea. All right, I'd ask for a two-week continuance. And I'd be cautious about any... Uh, retail building or anything like that out on the street frontage that far off a hard corner. Move for a two week continuance. Second. Okay. We have a motion and second for two week continuance with uh, the instruction that the applicant get with the neighbors. Cast your votes and that's approved. Thank you all for being here, Phil included. Um, I'm going to uh, take a 10-minute recess.
Okay, we'll uh, resume and start with what, item 19? Item 19 is SPUD 727 application by CJLE to rezone 10301 North I-35 Service Road from AA Agricultural to SPUD 727 and Ward 7. Janice gone? This is her ward. Oh, no, it's not either. Okay. David, afternoon. David Box, 522 Call Core Drive, here on behalf of the applicant. What you have before you is, and that's going around, you have an application for a commercial development uh, with some retail sales and uh, the ability to do personal storage along I-35 south of Hefner. Um, this is one that we have agreed to the majority of the appearance corridor guidelines. Um, there are five TEs, uh, number one and number five we can agree with, uh, two, three, and four we cannot agree with. We do uh, need a non-accessory sign on our site, um, as well as my client would like a 25-foot tall sign um, for the businesses that will be on site. Now, in anticipation of this uh, hearing, I went and did research out of ODOT to make sure that what we're asking for is not only within the confines of the state regulations for separation, uh, but the, the heightened requirements that the city has for separation. And I'm happy to report that our application uh, meets the most stringent separation requirements that are on the books. Um, that's what this application is about. It shows here. So what we're asking for is a, what we think will be a very good commercial development. Um, the only reason I'm addressing the billboard is because it's a, a TE that, that we're not in agreement with. But uh, what you see in front of you, as well as this exhibit, shows that we meet the separation requirements. And we think that's a, a key component. And also, when you look at the uh, pictures that I handed out, you see a series of other billboards and other uses that are, um, we think, more intense and um, more obtrusive than what we're asking for. So we think what we're doing is going to be an overall benefit, not only for the area, but for the I-35 corridor. And it's the, at least the billboard portion, is consistent with the I-35 corridor. Uh, with that, we'd ask for your approval. and happy to answer any questions. David, tell me the TEs again that you don't agree with. Yes, uh, number two, three, and four. One and five we're, we're perfectly fine with. Well, if I could just make a comment, Mr. Chairman, the, this, this particular handout that you handed out on yes, this, sir? this one right here, I think proves the point that this is an inappropriate application for a billboard and an EMD sign and uh, uh, because it's absolutely not competing with anybody along this corridor and because of the appearance guidelines that we have, the appearance corridor guidelines that we have, uh, I don't agree to eliminating two, three, and four of the TEs and if you don't agree with that, uh, then I would move to deny the application. Well, and, and I, we, we cannot agree to those, those three TEs. Um, and I, I would submit that our view is just different on what the pictures show. We, we think it shows that what, what we have is consistent uh, with the corridor. Well, David, that's kind of like saying I'm consistent with the signs along May Avenue. That's yeah. what we're trying to get away from. Uh, but I have another question for you. Yes, sir. You have basically a four-acre site here that you're rezoning. Is that correct? Mm. Yes, sir. And you're asking for some, what, 30, 35 permitted uses? What do you want to do on this site? Well, at this point, it's, it's speculative. Um, he, my client owns a, uh, a landscaping business, 
and he at some point might want to move there, but he's had a lot of interest from a, a host of different uh, end users. So what he wants to do is make sure that he has a parcel that is um, flexible enough to, to serve a host of different end users. So we have a speculative PUD here that's going to run to perpetuity with all these uses, and you, and you may or may not develop it for 10 years. And, but you may, in 10 years, put one of these uses on it, which in 10 years may or may not be appropriate. I think it will be developed um, well, it may or may not be. fairly quickly. It's just a matter of uh, which end user um, gets it. Nobody's willing to sign a lease agreement until... Well, I'm going to ask a question now because yes, no one else wants to, seems to want to talk about this. But we don't have a sunset provision for PUDs. So, since this is a speculative PUD, would your client agree that if it is not built out in accordance with these uses within a short period of time, three to five years, it will revert back to its present zoning? If, uh, if this commission was fine, he's not here for me to ask, but I, I think I can say uh, that if the commission is fine with deleting TE 2, 3, and 4, he would probably um, jump at the opportunity. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes, if, but without that, no. Well, uh, why I brought that up, and it may or may not be appropriate for this PUD, but uh, on speculative PUDs in the future, I, I believe that's going to be my stance. I concur with uh, Commissioner Bright and Commissioner Gales that, one, I can't, I can't support it with uh, eliminating the T's, two, three, and four, that's one. But then two, I wanted to have it more specifically, what is it going to look like? I know you got to submit a plan at, mm -hmm. at some point, but we, like I said, speculative. I don't know what it's going to really look like. Um, we do have a number of the cars that's facing uh, the appearance card, and I don't have any idea about the landscape and buffer as it requires. So uh, until I get a little bit more specific, I can't support the signage. So. I can't support the application with uh, the request that you're making. Second. Well, on the city council, we had a lengthy process with the billboard study several years ago, and it was the consensus, I thought, uh, and the policy adopted by us and the council that they didn't want additional billboards unless another billboard was removed. And I'm sort of surprised that the staff recommendation here that uh, this ought to be approved. This is a case where uh, I think the reason we're here is to uh, come to a conclusion with the information in front of us. And to that end, Mr. Chairman, we, we had an application in the last, I believe it's six months or a year, um, where we were granted approval for a, a parcel that was uh, some commercial zoning uh, that included a billboard. Um, so I think that's, um, that's part of the reason why you know, this client is coming forward, that there's been recent approvals that billboards have been granted. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second to deny this application. Cast your votes. It is denied. Thank you. Thank you. Item 20 is C6524, final plat of the homestead at Horn Valley, Section 1 in Ward 1. Again, Phil Hagen with Crafton & Tone Associates representing the applicant. Um, we are in agreement with all staff TEs, and we would like to add an additional TE. Um, there's some concern from the uh, neighbors to the north. There's a, their property is landlocked, and we want to commit that with the next phase of our development, we will provide two stub streets into their property have that in the record as a TE. Where, where, where you, where's that going to be? <laughs> this, this, this property originally as with preliminary plat, there's two different owners, the South 80 and the North 80 less the right of way. The South 80 was purchased by my client. There were some issues of pipeline easement that have since been resolved with the North portion. And so there's two, actually two different owners split at the, you know, the 80 line there. And so with the next phase, 
we're going to continue to loop around that pond and provide the stubs to the north so they have two points of access to their property. Basically, if you take that north line, extend it over to the west, westernmost red line there, that area is going to encompass phase two. And so we'll loop around that pond and provide the access. So you would do that at 25th, 26th Street at one point and uh, 24th Terrace on the other? Is that what I'm understanding? I'm having... Yeah, they'll come off of 25th Street. There'll be Horn Valley Boulevard and then the one of the ones to the east. That one and one to the east. Okay. Yeah. We're just committing to provide two access points in the next phase. Well, Mr. Yokel and members of the commission, I'm Bill Collins. I represent the owners of the property to the north. Uh, if you were to take the look at the north line of the plat and extend it all the way west to Sarah Road, my clients were on everything north of that. And the, the problem they've got is, is when the Turnpike Authority or ODOT uh, acquired the right of way for the Kilpatrick Turnpike, they cut off all access to my client's property. Uh, it's landlocked. And so when the preliminary plat came in, and uh, that was at a time when there was a contract for my clients to sell their property to the developer, uh, you know, that was all included in the preliminary plat. Well, now, unfortunately, that deal fell through, but perhaps it can be put back together because of what objections were at issue then have been resolved. But uh, at any rate, without access from this property to 23rd Street, my client's property is a heliport. So, so I'm just offering a, a, perhaps a, a word of caution and a voice of concern that uh, you keep access available to my client's property when other portions of this preliminary plat are, are final platted as we proceed to the, to the west. And I might point out that under the original preliminary, from what's being final platted right now, there was no direct access into my client's property. But you'll see that coming with future final plats. Uh, Bill, you, you heard what Phil said. Is that, yes. is that agreeable fact, with your client? I mean, is that, yeah, that that's sounds fine. rational to us. But yeah. you just want to be sure that it, yes. it's uh, maintained. He assured me then I would get a letter from somebody. Right. Uh, now, at the time we talked, uh, I haven't received that letter until I saw it on his his uh, his iPhone just a few minutes ago before we got started. Okay. Uh, and I think they're they're sincere in their intent to, to to provide that access. Now I know it's ordinance. There's an ordinance covering sub subjects and plus your, right. your subdivision regs, but I want to make sure on the record that you're aware of my Understood. client's concern and to, they're really at. Uh, your mercy when it comes to this, because they, like I said, it, it'll be a heliport if, if there's no access provided. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Bill. No one signed up, Commissioner. So with the addition of uh, the TE that Phil added, right? I'll move approval. Adding the with the additional TE providing to the access. Access to the north subject in, in okay. conformance with Mr. Collins' points that he made. All right. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. And it's, a, it's approved. Item 21 is PUD 1508, application by LM Real Estate LLC to rezone 13002 North Kelly from PUD 1441 to PUD 1508 in Ward 7. Good afternoon, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. Here on behalf of the applicant, also with me is Malik Massad. <clears throat> we were here two weeks ago, and the commission had concerns on uh, the height of our signs, the landscape buffer, and some of the uses. Um, in regards to the landscape buffer, the, well, let me say this. I have gone back with my client. We've come up with a, a height of a sign that is the minimum sign that, that they live with and so in the interest of maybe saving everyone time uh, those are a 141 foot sign a 138 foot sign and then the directional sign being eight feet um, so outside of that before we excuse me before we get off the signs, where will those 
can you? Those are, those are along Kelly. And on the site plan, uh, you'll see little tick marks uh, that represent where the sign Thank location um, would be. One of the other issues that this <laughs> mission had was the, the body shop. Oh, they're here. I get it. I see. Thanks. Thanks. And as of, as of yesterday, the architect was able to produce renderings of the body shop, and that's now what you see uh, before you. Now, in regards to the site plan that's up on the screen right now, it is a significant um, increase in the amount of trees. We, I think, more than double the trees just on the south boundary. You can see the significant <laughs> amount of trees uh, throughout the entirety of the development. Um, we're also in agreement, we had a meeting with Commissioner Williams to increase even more than what you see here, uh, the trees immediately south of the body shop. Um, I think what we said was 15 foot centers to provide an additional visual buffer from the Kilpatrick to that body shop. Um, what you can see from the renderings of the body shop that are up on the screen, it'll be very similar in, in style to what you see on the frontage. Um, it's, I think, what everyone's used to now with what car dealerships look like, the very nice uh, architectural metal panels. Um, we do still need those doors that face south, but we're hopeful that with the increased tree coverage, uh, as well as the even heightened tree coverage on the area immediately south, that we've satisfied the concerns of the Commission in regards to that. Uh, in regards to the uses, I, I've handed out a, a list of uses that uh, my client is fine with deleting. Um, all of the, the uses in the TE the staff has asked for we're fine with. We do just want to make sure the Commission understands. As long as some of the uses like outdoor storage that are accessory to the, gar the car dealerships uh, that, that normally go with that are included, then we're fine with deleting that use if they fall within the automobile dealership mall uh, and sale. So uh, to that end, we're fine with deleting these uses. I spoke to both the representative of the protester to the east, and he has since in the last week submitted a letter of support based on our prior agreement with him to have the 30-foot uh, buffer with the other things that I submitted last time as an exhibit to be included within the PUD. Um, I also spoke to Mr. Navard, who represents the uh, cemetery to the north, and he is also still in agreement and was supposed to or was going to send a letter of support, but he is still in uh, full support of this. We're agreeing to maintain the same agreement that the previous property owners had keeping that tree line. That will serve as a buffer to the north. So with that, um, there are a few TEs. One, uh, we agree with two of the uses, which we've discussed. Uh, three, there is a telecommunication tower on site, so we agree that it's, it's just limited to that one, but because of a pre-existing lease, we have to have that. Um, on four, on 9.1.1, um, we do have to have them facing south but just as you see them on the, the site plan, because of the way the Kilpatrick curves around our site, it would be virtually impossible to not have an element of one of the backs of the building facing, but hopefully with the amount of trees that we're planting, we've satisfied that concern. Um, overhead doors not facing south, we have to have those, but like I addressed, hopefully the amount of trees that we're proposing will, will satisfy that concern. Um, section 9, or TE 5, 9.2.3, uh, we are in agreement with as well as 9.2.4. Um, TE number 6 we're in agreement with. TE number 7, uh, there's an oversight on this site plan. We do feel like we need the three uh, curb cuts into this site because of our almost 750 feet of frontage and uh, having two separate dealerships. We certainly think having three would allow better flow of traffic along Kelly Avenue, especially on, say, like a Saturday when there's a lot of people coming in and out, not only for uh, the sales but also for, you know, the, uh, the body work, et cetera. There will be two dealerships, we're sure of that? Yes. At this point, we're, we are confirmed there will be two dealerships. Okay. Um, TE number eight is the signage I addressed, the 41, 38, and then the directional being eight. And then 9.10.2, 9.10.3, and 9.10.4, we are in agreement with. And David, what, what are you doing with the property, the eastern portion of that property that doesn't have anything on it? Right now, there's no plan. It, it, if we have to do any sort of detention or retention, um, that's the area that will be utilized. Also within that area will be the buffer to those neighbors to the east. And then we've added restrictions in there that if, say, any part of it were developed, 
there's limitations on how high light poles could possibly be within the first 100 feet, et cetera. But the portion that's blank, what you see on your site plan, is around 500, a uh, little more than 500 feet. And until we go to develop the site, we won't know if any retention or, or detention will be needed. But if so, we need to call out an area to, to hold for that. So you're not including that in this application? or No, it is. It is included in the application. But it's until we go and start pulling building permits and doing final engineering, we won't know what kind of detention or retention we may need. But it is included within the application. So under the application, if you wanted to use it for uh, wrecked cars or whatever, you could use that for wrecked cars? Or for, you for wrecked cars? Wrecked cars, huh? No, that, there won't, that's a collision center, isn't it? I don't think it's a collision. I'll let Malik explain that. But I don't think it's a collision center like junked cars. Um, I understand that. But th they look junked when they're wrecked, right? <laughs> Uh, Malik Massad, 1010 Castle Road, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73034. Yes, you wreck a car, it may look like junk. Okay. Our design of the body shop as being a, the most efficient body shop will give us a one to two day turnaround on wrecked cars. We do plan on covering an area of that for wrecked cars so that if it rains, what do you do with a wrecked car without a windshield or a back window or a door? You have to pull it inside the building. What does that do? It clogs up your body shop. So you think rainy days are good for business. They're actually horrible for business. It shuts us down. So what we'll do is we'll cover probably on the north side of the building a portion of that and uh, just northeast of the building for wreck cars. So that would cover them up, plus including all the increased landscaping. You probably won't even notice it. Okay. So what are you going to do with the property, the far east property that's not? designated for anything it'll stay greenfield or detention retention whatever's required by during development but it's included in here and my question was could you actually if you wanted to put damaged cars in there in essence yes and would we no okay part of the problem if we did not include that within this application if you'll recall the pud that's in place right now would allow a stripped out office warehouse use. So if we didn't include that, what you could see is what we're proposing. And then for the east 550 feet, uh, no landscaping uh, commitments and stripped out office warehouse use with a series of overhead doors. Okay. David, could you come back to allay Commissioner Allen's concern, perhaps uh, designate, we're saying that last 550 feet is going to be basically retention and green belt. Can you put that in the PUD and then if subsequently you want to come back and develop it? Come back and amend the PUD? We're fine with that. Good. That's where the hotel is going to go. Well, that's, well, that's my good. big question. Whatever. But, you know, so far it looks like they've addressed everything we asked them to address two weeks ago. Uh, and I'm impressed with the application at this point. I just, I'm just saying here. I have two questions. Uh, in the, on the uh, uh, P number five, the landscaping, is this, he said, you agree with that, but is that what I'm seeing here? No, I'm guessing, more? I'm guessing that's about a 200% increase. From then I'd like to see, th I, that'll be part of the PUD. The what site plan. This right here. The, so site, the site plan is what we see is what we're going to get. I mean, there might be slight variations in, in well we're modifying te5 yeah. on part or part of te5 he, he modified to 15 foot that's center. my point uh, on the portion by the building well, yeah. yeah so we need to to modify te5 as i understand it what you're asking us to do is to delete te4 911 and 912 Correct. Well, I guess that's all of TE4, basically. Right. Correct. Uh, and then TE5 would be amended to provide for the 15-foot centers along the, uh, the southern south correct. or the along adjacent to the body shop. Correct. You would like to change TE3 to three access points. Correct. TE7. Uh, seven. Seven. seven, I'm sorry. Three, three, three access points. points. And uh, then you discuss signage in... Uh, 
of 41 and 38. Yes. Well, but also you've got TE number two that has additional deletions other than what's depicted in well, TE number two. Well, that's according to this. I mean, we would submit that in place of TE two as it's more encompassing. No, that's what I'm getting at, except that I have a curiosity. Why is, why is funeral and interment services and lodging accommodations part of the uses that you want when you have car dealerships and car, because if you want to put a hotel on there, I don't know what, I don't know what controls there are. I mean, I really don't. So you could come back and say, this didn't work, I want to do a hotel, and you have a whole different uh, uh, floor plan for developing a hotel or a funeral home or something else. I'm very comfortable with what you've done, even the size of the signs, because they're on Kelly, and there's no flashing stuff. And from the viewpoint of Kilpatrick Turnpike, I think you'll just be able to see the tops of them. But Kelly has those car dealerships over there. So with respect to what you've done, I'm in agreement. But I don't think funeral, interment, and lodging belongs in this application today. I think the goal of any zoning application is, uh, when a developer looks at it, is thinking, projecting out. Um, you see a lot of vacant car dealerships that uh, may have been zoned just for car dealership, and now you're having to go do all kinds of things to get it redeveloped. So what we try to do is curtail it down to just the uses that would be appropriate for the corridor. Um, we think with the cemetery next door, the funeral use seems appropriate. <coughs> and to your question of what controls and yeah. how are you protected, the the, the increased by 20 percent, if it weren't the car dealership, uh, of the appearance corridor guidelines, I think, is a protection. The, all the other, there's a, a list of the appearance corridor guidelines that we agree to, and that would serve as the protection, what if the car dealerships were to go dark in 10, 20, 30 years? Well, so we think get, those protections have been. You get 40-foot signs you know, for a hotel. Uh, I mean, but you see what I mean, that just that, that you have a call that you're going to put this together. If it doesn't work, we'll come back and say, this didn't work, I want to do an application. Just like this is the second phase of what we used, what we saw with those lines of buildings that were along here and each one was done. Well, that didn't work, take that off the table. And that, had, that had a lot of uses, so you, took, you put this together. And I just don't think that funeral, I mean, I think it might be appropriate at some time, but not today and not a hotel. Three access points, maybe that's not appropriate, you know, for a hotel. You see what I mean? It's got, it, it may not fit. For, we will give up the funeral use and the, the lodging use. Okay. Well, with that, I move approval of that. Are we going to do it? No, you can go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, move, I yeah. appreciate the uh, efforts that you guys have done to work it out. A good, a good scheme for us. And, uh, with the modifications to the T's, I move that we approve the application. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 19 as conditioned. Cast your votes. Thank you, Thank gentlemen. You. Oh, 21, I'm sorry, I said 19. Yeah. My apologies. Wait, so 19 did get approved? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Uh, item 22 is being continued. Item 23 is CE 862. Is anybody here for that? We're going to move that to the heel. Yep. Um, item 24 is SPUD 732, an application by Chris Mudd to rezone. 7805 South Penn from I-1 single family to SPUD 732, Board 5. I'm Chris Mudd. Uh, we're simply asking that the dwelling at 7805 South Penn, which is just like two or three blocks south of I-240 on South Penn, that it be rezoned from residential to mixed use in order that we would be able to uh, have a little law office there. Uh, from what we can tell, it would have very little impact on the neighborhood or the area. There would be very little traffic, especially compared to the 
uh, child care facility that was there before. Uh, we would anticipate that we would have to improve the appearance, do quite a bit of work on the outside and the inside of the home, uh, which would help the neighborhood at least to some extent. Uh, the trend uh, appears to be going that way as far as uh, commercial or mixed use from I-240. There is a uh, insurance agency directly across the street. There's a uh, nail facility. I think I can't remember exactly what it is, but on the on the east side of Penn Street, all the way to I-240, it's all commercial. On the west side, which is where we are, it's commercial up to about two houses or three houses from where we're asking that this zone zoning be changed. Uh, we don't think it would have very big impact on the area or uh, as far as traffic is concerned or any other area. And we just ask that it be, that we be allowed to uh, put a law office there. Commissioner, no one signed up. I just have, I have one question. Uh, yeah. It has the parking lot out in the front. It has a little parking lot right there for about th three to five cars. Yeah, do we have any type of landscaping in front of that parking? I beg your pardon? Do we have any type of landscaping in front of that parking to kind of screen it? Uh, no, it's the parking is on the on the south side of the of the building. Uh, there's nothing there's nothing there screening it from Penn Street. So none of the parking is visible from the street? Uh, it would be visible. It, it would be visible from Penn Street, yes. Yeah. But we wouldn't anticipate there being more than two or three cars there at a time. Could we put some kind of landscaping in front of it? Could we, Could put, we some put some landscaping? I'd like to see some type of landscaping uh, around the parking lot. I don't know what you'd be talking about, but shrubs, anything, hedges, anything within reason. Would shrubs, hedges, you know, of plants, course. plants right, like that. Sure. One of the things that we uh, would like to have is, is to be able to put a, up a monument sign right there, you know, with, with, within the right code uh, restrictions. Uh, but, you know, whatever was appropriate, we'd be perfectly happy to do. Well, okay. Because I say you can't do the same. I mean, it wouldn't be that big a thing. Yeah, look, part of your, look, part of your parking is in the site triangle, so I don't mm -hmm. know. But anyway, where you can landscape it without bending the sure. uh, site triangle and around your sign, I'd just like you to include that into your, right. your development. I have two comments. One, one in general is that uh, this particular activity you've been conducting in this, I mean, there's been commercial activity office in this house. There has for a been, number there's of been years. a child care facility there, to my well, understanding. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, and we've encountered this over many, many times. On any given street in Oklahoma City, Penn, 23rd, 36th, you name it, uh, you see these commercial activities going on that next door to residences and then all of a sudden it feeds into one and another and another without any comprehensive plan about what to do about those kinds of redevelopment. Either you restrict them totally and you can't do it. And we've done that before on 10th Street, I think, a couple of them over the past several years. I mean, that's my general comment. I'm not in favor of any further encroachment in residential areas on these, what we call arterial streets, Pennsylvania, et cetera. But in, in your case, something's been going on there for a long time. Mm -hmm. And with James's comment about the landscaping on the parking lot to shield that from the house that people live in right across the street, I would, I would, I would request that you do that in this application and reduce down the size of your monument size sign from eight feet to four. This is, in, this is still a residential area. You know, you can have a four foot sign, people can see it from the street. There's no sign competition. It'll be law office, whatever, you know, whatever you want to put there. But uh, so with this application, I would approve it because there's so many things going on, as you described, office and commercial up and down this street. But for the most part, I oppose all of them. And on this case, I don't oppose it except that, and I would move to approve it, if you agree to 
landscape the parking lot so that it has something something there that, that shields it from the neighbor across the street and have a four-foot monument sign. The neighbor across the street is a farmer's insurance agency. That's what that's that's why I'm that's why I don't object to this application. Right. I mean, but but just for the neighbor next door, right? That's a house. People live there, I assume, to the west. You know, I mean, so just for that, for the neighborhood, landscape the parking lot and reduce down the monument sign to four feet. Those are my comments. I don't know about the other commissioners, what they would have, but uh, I, I would support it with those revisions. Uh, I think we'd be okay with that, yeah. I don't think there's no other signs in that area, so I don't see where it'd be, you know, there would be any other competition. <laughs> And that's my point. It, it, right. And it would be a monument sign, nicely done, landscaped right. around by Absolutely. the... Absolutely. Right. Okay. Well, it will, based upon that, those two additions to the GEs, I will move approval of the application. Do we have a second? All in favor? Aye. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <clears throat> item 25 has been continued. Item 26 is C6529. Final plat of Braxton, section one in Ward three. Hmm? Keep it moving. Jason Spencer with Craft and Toll, here to represent the applicant. Well, we've got the application for final plat for 29 acres located north of Reno between Frisco and Cemetery Road. It contains 60 single family lots, which is in accordance with the uh, agreement made with the approved preliminary plat. Um, we do request a uh, variance with TE number three and also to amend TE number four. Uh, I can start with a variance on TE number three. Um, it deals with uh, center line offsets on the intersections. And what we've got uh, is a separation between Northwest 2nd Street and Northwest 3rd Street along Braxton Way. It's 105 feet. I can show you that right here. That's this intersection, these two here. And so the requirement is 110, and we asked for a variance to allow the 105-foot separation because what we've got is, is a curve right here on Braxton Way, and basically we're trying to tie in tangent to that curve at the point of reverse curvature right here. It just makes for a cleaner layout, and geometrically it works. We think it makes sense and may uh, clean up the plot a little bit and be a little bit easier during construction. We'd ask for a variance on that T. And the other thing you want to do on uh, TE4 is delete everything after 2014, put a period after 2014 and delete yes, the that is correct. part of the, okay. And that is because we do meet the, uh, I think that was put in there for uh, access requirements, but we do meet the uh, current regulation with the boulevard entrance. Okay, motion on the variance. We have a motion and a second to approve the variance TE3, cast your votes, and it's approved. Condition with the deleting the second part of TE4. Okay, we have a motion and a second as condition. Okay. Item 20, I'll look at this time, 26. 26. Cast your votes and you're approved. Thank you. Thank you. Item 27 is C6530, the final plat of the Grove, phase six in Ward 8. Good afternoon, Tim Johnson. Johnson Associates on behalf of the applicant. Um, we reviewed the staff's comments. This is an infill plat on uh, the plat to the south of this is under construction and the plat to the north of this is uh, in place. And so this will be an infill plat. And uh, we agree with all the staff's technical evaluations. Nobody signed up? We have a motion and a second to approve item 27. Cast your votes. Thanks. And it's approved. Thank you. Item 28 is C6532, final plat of Valencia Park, edition section 16. Good afternoon. Chris Anderson with SMC Consulting Engineers representing the developer. Uh, read the staff report, and I would like to ask for a modification to TE number 3. It references uh, Valencia Park section 10, 12, and 14 to be constructed before this plat goes to city council. Section 10 is under construction right now. Uh, section 12 and 14, we're in the process of getting approved plans on. In a meeting with the developer earlier this week, it's come up that uh, Section 16 is a different uh, product line than those other two plats. 
So they're entertaining the idea with the way the market has kind of changed on them up there a little bit of possibly doing 16 before the other two plats on the construction. If you'll remember, on 12 and 14, we agreed to do an emergency access road uh, along Andalusia and then up Valencia Drive out to 192nd. So what we would like to do on this uh, TE number three is amend it to say at the end of that or construct an emergency access road uh, to connect to Andalusia Drive. Connect to what, I'm sorry? Andalusia Drive. Okay. And does that meet the staff's concern? Pardon? I was, I was asking staff a question. <coughs> they answered. I have a question um, on uh, page five, the comment from the fire marshal's office. I think that's what this addresses. That's why I was just con just wanted to confirm that. That's what this is. Thank you. Okay. We have motion is second to approve item 28. Cast with your vote. The, with the uh, <coughs> amendment. With the modification of TE3. TE3. Yes. Cast your votes. And it's approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Item 29 is an ordinance to be introduced and set for public hearing on October the 24th. This uh, modifies Chapter 59 of the Municipal Code to address gardening and urban agriculture in the city. Chickens? This is chickens, yeah. Yeah. No chicken. And you voted to remove the set. <laughs> That's what we voted. Right. We voted to set it. We agreed to set it. Yes, this is, this the, is set. the set. We, we agreed they were going to tweak it, a couple of items, yeah. and we were going to right. hear it or set it today. Okay. So we'll yeah. set that the chicken set. Yeah. That's right. Well, I don't like the chicken, but. So uh, Mike has made a motion. I made a motion to say. We need a second. <laughs> second. All right. Okay, we have approved setting it for our next meeting, which is the 24th of October, I think. That's right. And uh, we now have item 23, which we didn't deal with. There's been three continuances. I move to deny. <laughs> I mean, we're not going to approve this. Uh, okay. I mean, if, if the applicant were present, we've indicated two, three times that we're not going to, that we won't approve this. So I move to deny. Okay. We have a motion and a second to deny item 23. Cast your votes. It is denied. Planning Commission committees, Planning Commission members. I won't be here at the next meeting. I'll be out of town. Anyone else? Planning Department? Russell? Um, just a reminder that we have, we have one more CAT meeting and then we have a uh, symposium on November the 1st where we bring all the consultants back into town. So just a reminder for that. And the Citizens Advisory Team met a, t a week ago Tuesday. Correct. On the day the government shut down as the facilitator mediated, we had 30 plus folks there, staff, volunteers from the city, moving Oklahoma City forward while the federal government was shut down. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so that, there's an example there. She pointed that out. I'm not taking credit for it, but that was an example. I have a, Mr. Chairman, I have an observation, one for clarity. We, you know, we traditionally have been saying that uh, we have a final plat, that the final plat is in compliance with the preliminary plat, but today we realize that maybe there was already that, but really the final plat and the preliminary plat has no real tie. I mean, the, the preliminary plat has no real significance. So. By saying that the final plan is in compliance with the preliminary plan has no, no well, it, 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 it's a useful tool, okay. Jack, James, because we get a lot of things set out in discussion with the applicant and interested party stakeholders at that stage, and uh, oftentimes those things are pretty well settled, and okay. so it, it is a significant tool. I mean, it's not a final uh, vote, but it's a tool. But when we vote on the final plan. 
the only appeal for that is district court. I mean, that doesn't go to council. So, I mean, that, yeah. that's, we're, we're setting it okay. well, in, in addition, firm at that point. In addition, with an approved preliminary plat, the applicant can proceed with certain things. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, but, but you know, based on what James just said, for the first time since I've been on this commission, have I known what the significance was of a preliminary plat? which is, as you say, John, a tool. tool. It has no relevance whatsoever when we come in with a final plan. Oh, no, 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 that's not no, what no, I, wait, wait, that's not what I said. We learned this today. No, no we didn't. No. Well, I did. <laughs> no, that <laughs> no, I did. I, I learned a lot. I learned a, I, did. I learned a lot today with this particular <laughs> yeah. event. But, but that was not the message that we received that the preliminary or the preliminary plat doesn't mean anything. No, 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 no. It's a tool. I understand that. You know, but but its relevance when you come in and they say this final plat doesn't conform to the preliminary plat. My opinion, I think I also would have thought that well, you've got to come back and do another preliminary plat. Not so. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, that was my misunderstanding. But I've, I've had that comment several times. Well, why doesn't it comply with what you said before? Well, they really don't have to. Well, they, but there's uh, a distinction that applicants usually make and that is a practice with the staff and with us, and that is uh, if we've approved a preliminary plat and, you know, the design and all the, all the things that are included in it, uh, we've pretty well vetted it by the time it gets here. But there are times when circumstances change on the ground and an applicant comes in and we'll see that, that there's some minor modification. And we, we, right. we will go forward with those. But but wait, but let me finish. When uh, we get significant changes, generally the staff asks that they prepare a new preliminary plat and go through the process with the staff and stakeholders and come back with a revised preliminary plan if it's distinctly different. And they do that. That's been the natural course of business. Could someone refuse to do that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But as a practical matter, it doesn't work for them to do that. What we, so heard, not what we heard today, though, we yeah. denied the preliminary plat based upon all of these factors. Yeah. And they come in with a final plat after this is a hundred percent denial of everything that they wanted to do yeah, that's what, without changing a word. Yeah, he was here to set that up. Enough said. Oh, well, okay. I don't well, want to say more about it. Enough yeah. said. <laughs> uh, Please. Okay. Municipal Councilor. Enough said. Enough said. Okay, we're adjourned. <laughs>